All right, I think it's recording. Yes, it is. All right, let's um, share the screen. That one that he's to say. All right, hello everyone. Welcome back to the Majesty of Reason. And today we are having a discussion between Dr. Alex Malpass and Dr. Wes Morriston. This discussion is basically a review of the discussion that I had with Rob Coons on the channel Intellectual Conservatism. That discussion on intellectual conservatism was on the Kalam and causal finitism, as the thumbnail so eloquently gives away. Now, just a few notes before we get started. First, my extensive notes on the discussion that I had between Rob and myself, those are going to be available to patrons. The document is gonna be available to patrons. I took like 7,000 or 8,000 words of reflections on it. So if you want that, and if you want lots of other goodies, some very special goodies, definitely consider becoming a patron. And actually, this is a good place to talk about the structure of the video that you are watching right now. Of course, right now you are in the introduction section of the video. The second portion of the video is going to be a discussion between me and Alex and Wes. And then the third and final part is going to be me basically going through that document that I just mentioned, the 7,000 word document or whatever, and essentially just talking through it, talking about my reflections on the video on intellectual conservatism. I should say, if you haven't watched that, well then, this video won't make much sense. So I recommend watching that video first. It's linked in the description. So yeah, definitely check that out. And then of course, come back to this video. All right, the second thing to note is that my book, Existential Inertia and Classical Theistic Proofs has been offered a publishing contract with Springer. So that is super duper fun. That is an international peer reviewed press. So I'm very happy and very excited about that. Yours truly is the first author. And then the second author, so it's a co-authored work. The second author is Daniel J. Linford. He is graduating with his PhD from Purdue University uh, this May. And yeah, he's a philosopher of physics and he helped with a lot of the stuff on relativity theory and how that relates to the metaphysics of persistence. Super cool and fun stuff. And in fact, I thought I would just show you the extended table of contents for that. So if you're curious, you can pause it and look at these, but uh, I'm just going to be scrolling through these just for those of you who are curious. And again, the production process takes a very long time, so don't get your hopes up. And of course, before getting into the discussion between me and Alex and Wes, check out my playlist. And in particular, most relevantly for purposes here, is my Kalam Cosmological Argument playlist. Thank you guys both for coming on. And maybe we should just start with like overall thoughts. So um, maybe Alex, I'll turn it over to you for that. And then we can uh, go to Wes and then we'll just open it up. Well, it was really interesting discussion. Really interested to see what Rob would say to a lot of the things that you said because the things we'd been talking about um previously anyway so things of um positions that we were sort of working through like an unsatisfiable pair and stuff like that and uh you also brought up the kind of future directed versions um of the paradoxes which i guess i was thinking about like two years ago um so those things were all interesting to see and obviously I thought you did a very good job of explaining the, you know, the setup, the, <clears throat> the motivations behind those like positions and stuff. So I thought that was all um, predictably very clear and, and um, well communicated on your part. Um, obviously I think Rob's very um, intelligent and capable philosopher who's, um, you know, a formidable theist philosopher, one of the leading uh, people in his field. So, you know, I don't want to be like critical in the sense that um, I, I, it's one of those things where it's like, there, I think there's a debate to be had, a discussion about the points, but I'm not, I haven't, I'm not completely like convinced of um, the merits of, of, of anything on this really. I mean, I, uh, you know, there are positions I like and there are sort of things I see more clearly than others, but I think I'm, I think you have to be uh, cognizant of the fact that like Rob's super smart and has thought about all of this stuff a lot as well. Um, and it may well just be that that um, what I say is wrong and what he say, says is right. Um, it's not like having some kind of trivial conversation with someone who's, you know, just a strong player in the game. Having said that, I did think that um, 
So I, yeah, I, th I think that he started off with presenting a kind of um, a really interesting objection to this unsatisfiable pair stuff, like really forcefully put um, and better that actually than the sort of standard ones that I've seen in the literature. Like there's not much about this in the literature, but there's a few of them. And um, I actually think the way Rob put it made me think again um, and question stuff, which was really nice because as a philosopher, what you want to do is pair things right back to the foundations and like build up again from the bottom upwards to see if you still like the idea. Um, so someone uh, offering a pointed criticism that doesn't, doesn't seem superficial is, is what you want really. Um, so that was interesting. I thought the stuff about, uh, I won't go on for too long. I thought the stuff about the liar paradox and that type of thing was kind of frustrating because um, I wanted to hear more about what he thought there, but there was some amount of, well, you know, I worked on this for 15 years and like, it's just not going to work and blah, blah, blah. And it was a bit of a backhand. Um, and I mean, even if he's right about that, I still just, you know, you come away not knowing what that was that he had up his sleeve. Um, so, so that, that bit was, that was frustrating. Um, yeah. So I guess all in all, there was like, there was a lot of back and forth. It was very interesting. Um, I guess we'll get into the meat of it, but you know, just generally there were some things I wanted to go into more that, that we weren't able to get to, but it's the nature of these things, I suppose. That's why we have reviews so we can go into the detail a bit more. Yeah. So Wes, what, what about you? Um, I guess the, the heart of it has to do with this patchwork principle. Um, it, it seems like a bit of a moving target to me. Uh, I mean, it's agreed on all sides that there are going to have to be exceptions to it. And when you run into a contradiction with one of these imaginary examples, that tells you that there must be some class of exceptions. Um, that takes care of this, this kind of case. Um, Rob Kuhn seems to think that the only possible way to take care of this kind of case is, is to endorse causal finitism. And that's, it's not so obvious to me. Um, he seemed to treat the unsatisfiable pair diagnosis as if, um, the person advocating it uh, were simply rejecting reductio ad absurdum arguments. And, and that's not the case, uh, because as you pointed out right away, um, you know, the, the argument is that there has to be some exception to this, to this uh, recombination principle, this patchwork principle. Um, and uh, the UDP suggests uh, where that modification might go. Um, and Rob says, no, 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 uh, patchwork principle works unless there's some very excellent causal story about why it doesn't work. And I found myself, I was just kind of left wondering, why does he think that's so obvious? And very deep into the discussion, uh, I believe you asked him, well, you know, why is a causal explanation to be preferred to the sort of non-causal explanation that I'm giving? And he basically just repeated, um, he, he just repeated his position himself. at that yeah. point. So, you know, he probably has more to say about this, but I don't quite know, I don't quite know what it is. Um, the other thing that I, that I found myself wondering about, uh, which really didn't come up so much in your discussion with him, is what is this about intrinsic properties? Um, and are the properties that Rob is appealing to really intrinsic? I mean, he has to assume that each one of these reapers, not only are the powers and dispositions intrinsic properties, so that, you know, but he has to assume that the reapers are successful in sending the signal on or what have you. And I think his thought must be that if you have two or three of these right next door to them, their internal properties are such that 
it's impossible for them to fail. But that isn't exactly what he says in his two, 2014 news article. So I'm, I'm a bit confused about this. I mean, if you build a success condition in, then it looks like it's not going to be an intrinsic property. Yeah, that's going to depend because, on the infinitely because many other. Success, because success requires that something be happening elsewhere. Yeah. Right? Whereas the intrinsic properties are supposed to be whole contained within this particular region of space time. Uh, and so I, I, there's something there that I'm really kind of confused about. Not sure what his story is. Yeah, that's interesting. And I mean, so what I was thinking is um, he uses this Patrick principle and I was trying to press him on like the causal versus non-causal explanation to go back to your point there. And it did, I was listening, I was re-listening to it. And I'm like, all he, like, again, he might have reasons elsewhere uh, in favor of why we should have just a, a restriction to causal explanations as to why those are the only things that can serve as defeaters for the principle or exceptions. But in the discussion, he simply repeated it once I, I pressed him on it. Um, and I don't know. I just, I thought I, if we're going to dig into this deeper because I know I sent both of you guys the document and I had a bunch of different like exceptions and I was analyzing each of these exceptions. And it seems like a lot of them don't actually, after all, end uh, in causation being the explanation as to why the, the Patro principle fails in these cases. Um, now, I guess uh, one thing that I wanted to start with um, was that in Kuhn's kind of opening statement, as it were, in the discussion, he said that there's like no reason whatsoever to think that infinite causal regresses are possible. Uh, and that actually played a role later on when he was saying that, oh, the only way that you could carve out an exception to the, the Patrick principle is if you had some sort of independent reason for uh, thinking that infinite causal regresses are possible. Or he said something along those lines later on in the discussion. And I mean, I think that that's just mistaken. I mean, I can give a bunch of different reasons, albeit you know potentially defeasible ones for thinking that um, infinite causal regresses are possible. I mean, suppose, and again, a lot of these might be controversial if we're like mitigated modal skeptics or something like that. But setting that aside, we might think that conceivability provides defeasible evidence for possibility. I can, I can easily conceive of an infinite uh, causal regress. I can imagine, let's say an infinite past and there's like a, a particle that just emits some kind of, I don't know, Elect electromagnetic field every second uh, for an eternal past. So I can conceive of it if that gives me defeasible evidence for possibility. Well, then we do indeed have some weight of a reason for thinking that infinite regresses, infinite causal regresses are possible. A second reason might be um, something like induction, right? So like every day that we've experienced is such that it has a day right before it. Um, and we might think that given that inductive base, we can uh, at least infer the possibility that every day has a day before it. And then if that's true, well, then you'd get the possibility of an infinite past. Now, of course, um, this is like defeasible and so on. Uh, but that's at least some weight of a reason, arguably. A third thing is someone might appeal to modal seemings or modal appearances. It might just seem to someone uh, that it's uh, possible that you could have infinite causal regresses. It might just seem to someone possible that uh, you could have, let's say, an infinite past or, um, yeah, any any sort of benign or... Um, perfectly innocuous infinite causal chain. A fourth one is like versions of the Patrick principle that allow us to multiply spatio-temporal regions themselves, right? So like uh, if we allow those kinds of Patrick principles, well then we can patch up an infinite past uh, and that'll give us at least some defeasible reason because so we can take individual space-time regions and then just duplicate them next to each other, add infinitum into the past. And so that would give us at least some defeasible weight of a reason for thinking that it's possible that um, infinite causal regresses obtained. Uh, and there are still other motivations and so on. Uh, so for instance, uh, uh, perfect being theists in the literature on perfect being theism and so on, and how it relates to like possibility and God's power. A lot of theists are moving to saying, moving towards saying that, um, hey, we're in the business of giving God more power. And so perfect being considerations themselves can give someone reason to include some things as possible that one would otherwise have no reason to think uh, is possible. And so it gives God more power to say that uh, God could actualize infinite causal chains. Uh, and so that's yet another reason for thinking that uh, it's a kind of theistic consideration, but in this dialectical context where Kuhn's is a theist, that's, you know, that's fine. And, and there are other ones as well. So like Josh Rasmussen's modal uniformity, uh, which is basically like, hey, if X is possible and it differs merely in quantity or degree from some 
from some why, well, then we have defeasible reason to think that why itself is possible. Um, Joss gives the example of like vases. So like if we know that a four feet tall vase is possible and a six feet tall vase is possible, well, then different vases that differ from those vases merely in terms of degree to properties like height, we have some defeasible reason to think that they're possible. And he goes on to try to justify that and so on. Uh, but given that we know that the past has some kind of quantity or length, and given that an infinite past differs from that in terms of just degree, well, then we'd have some defeasible reason for thinking that an infinite past and consequently infinite causal regresses are possible and so on. So I could go through a huge list and I'm not going to, but I just wanted to, to target that claim there because it plays an important role in what Kuhn says later on. Um, that he, he repeatedly says in that discussion that we have no reason whatsoever to think that infinite causal regresses are possible. And I just think that that's mistaken. But anyway, I'll, I'll turn over to you guys, maybe Alex, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I think that's right. It does seem overstating it quite a lot to say there's literally no reason. It's a bit like a kind of cliche atheist saying, well, oh, there's no reason to believe that God exists or something. It just feels like a massive overstatement. I mean, you might not by those reasons, but to say there aren't any just seems a bit over the top. Um, and I guess I'm interested in the way that you can use the patchwork principle to, to make a case for that. Because it's something sort of, it almost seems something that's circular about the patchwork principle in this sort of case. I mean, patchwork principle is good for giving you like a local guide to possibilities or whatever, like it's, you know, uh, if I start peeling my satsuma and there's an even number of segments or something, I, I, I can sort of patch together and imagine there being one more segment than there actually was or something. You know, those types of things are yeah, fair enough. But um, once you start saying, look, the way Rob puts it is like, you've got, you take an individually possible thing, like a Grim Reaper or a satsuma or something. And then um as long as you can find a container world that's big enough for it, then you can patch that in, basically. So if you have two, like a Satsuma and an orange or whatever, and individually one in each world, as long as you've got a container that's big enough to put them in, then, um, so that's a third world that's just simply a container that says something about how big worlds can be. Then there's a fourth world where you can put them both in. It's the same size as the container world. But once you start thinking, well, I want to multiply infinitely many, say, Satsumas or whatever, um, it feels like I've got to answer this question of, well, is there a container world big enough to put them in? Um, and that seems to be to, to be taking a stand, even if hypothetically, on whether there is a world of that kind of size or whatever. I mean, and if we're saying I want to arrange them in a beginningless chain, then, you know, is there a container world big enough to put them in? If there is then there is a container world big enough to put them in. Um, even if it turns out that you can't fit them all together because it results in some contradiction, I helped myself to a container world earlier on in this. So there is one. So, you know, I can't get to the end of the proof showing that it's impossible unless I assume that that world is there in some way, right? Um, but then if there isn't a world, because it, by the time I get to the end of the proof, I realize that it, such a world is contradictory or something, then I, it feels like I wasn't allowed to help myself to it earlier on in the proof or something. I, I don't know. And so maybe I'm, maybe I'm being stupid. I mean, so that's always possible. But it just feels to me like there's something kind of weird about applying patchwork principles to the kind of extent of space-time if it, it has to have in it some kind of condition about how great the extent of space-time can be. You know, at, before you get to the end of the application of that principle. So there's something almost circular about it. Um, it makes me suspicious about using it in that context, where I might be fine using it in certain contexts. Uh, it gives me reason to think, um, you know, not, not decisive, of course, but just some kind of reason to be suspicious about using it in these kind of grand global metaphysical contexts anyway. So yeah, I, I, do, think, I do find that sort of interesting. Well, wouldn't he just say that um, that his claim is that if there is a possible world, a container world that's big enough, whatever that amounts to, um, then you could patch all these reapers or whatever into it, uh, these signalers um, into it, and get the paradox. And so 
what his reductio is really a reductio of is the claim that there's a big enough, a, 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 a possible world, that, a container mm. world that's big enough. So it's just a sort of hypothetical. And then, and then I guess, and then I guess, it's a consequence of that that there can't be a beginningless causal chain because yeah. there's no world big enough for one. Yeah, that's how I, I that's how I saw it. So basically, if you could have a framework world in which there are infinitely many causal nodes, then we could use the Patrick principle to patch into those nodes all these individual and intrinsically specified possibilities in such a way that you get a contradiction. And so you can't have such a, a world with infinitely many causal nodes. That's what I was thinking the structure of his kind of argument was. Yeah, I guess maybe that's right then. But then, so the... the yeah, so I guess then, so this comes down to the like thing he was saying at the beginning, which was about like, well, isn't the UPD just a kind of like foolish response to a reductio? Because in a, in a reductio, you just go, here's a bunch of assumptions. They're jointly inconsistent. So we're going to reject one of them. Which one do we want to reject? Uh, something like that. And then the whole, a good reductio has like one non-contingent uh, assumption and rest just logically necessary or whatever. Um, and that, you know, you have to deny the first one then in that case. Um, but in these cases, none of, well, none of the main assumptions are logically necessary. They're all metaphysical propositions, right? So it's, you know, a beginningless universe. You know, the patchwork principle is always true or something. Um, we're, not, we're not forced by logic to reject any one of those in particular. I mean, you're forced by logic to have to reject at least one of them, but none of them in specifically. So it's not quite the same as sort of standard reductios, it seems to me. It's a sort of metaphysical um, cousin of a, of a sort of traditional logical reductio argument. And like, well, I guess it seems to me that the point is just the, the UPDist is just gonna say something like, well, um, it's the combination of both of the like. There's a there's a possible world that's large enough to fit the reapers in, and there's infinitely many reapers. But all the all that um, the argument shows us is that you can't have both of those. Um, but I think when when it's this kind of like modal uh, aspect to it, like none of this is supposed to be true in the actual world. It's just like, are there possible worlds where these things are true? I think you can sort of like, this is like a step backwards you can take where it's like, I can say, well, it's possible that, the, you know, it, there's, it, there's a possible world which is beginningless, let's say, and it seems right, at least in broadly speaking. And there's, you know, infinitely many possible worlds, each of which has a Grim Reaper in it or something. Um, but it, I don't think I have to say from that anything about whether there's um, a world where both of those things are true. Right, and if it turns out that they're logically inconsistent to have both of those true, then there definitely isn't a world like that, and that's it. You know, I I can just sort of remain agnostic about it because it's not like saying here are two or three propositions that are jointly inconsistent, and I'm saying well I'm just you know not going to reject any of them. That would be weird, right? You you kind of have you know you have to reject one of them, but in this case where it's like. Well, the propositions themselves are claims about things that are possible. Um, I think I can just sort of say, well, there's, you know, they're, they're, they're possible because there are distinct worlds that realize those uh, states of affairs. Um, and all the proof shows us is that there's no individual world that realizes all of them together. And, and that really does seem to me more substantial than, than the way he was generalizing it. Like, it's not just a rejection of all reductio arguments. It's, it's specifically something to do with um, these types of metaphysical versions of reductios, in particular where the premises are claims about things that are possible but not actual. Um, it's in those environments, it seems to me, where the, the unsatisfiable pair diagnosis really starts to look like the right way to go. Um, but yeah, I wonder what you guys think about that. I mean, maybe I didn't explain that very well, but um, if, if, if I made sense, I wonder what you think about that. Yeah, so... I mean, I think what he was trying to do is like, we reach a contradiction in some way or another from a, a collection of propositions. And really what he was trying to do is ask which assumption 
of those or which proposition among those is it most reasonable to reject? I think that's really what he was trying to get at. And so, you know, he gave the example of like Euclid's proof, right? So um, Euclid has a kind of initial assumption, uh, which is like, hey, assume that there are only finitely many prime numbers. That's the one that Euclid's going to want to ultimately try to reject. And then Euclid has a bridge principle, we can call it. And we could just say it's Euclid's bridge principle that, hey, if there is an arbitrary finite collection of prime numbers, well, then it's possible to you know, multiply them together and then add one to the resultant number. Uh, and then from those, you, can, you could derive that, that that resultant number would actually be a, a further prime number and you get the, the contradiction. Now, um, you can imagine, like as Coons is pointing out, you can imagine someone coming along and saying, well, hey, I actually reject your bridge principle. Uh, and so, you know, your proof can't really get up and running because I, I reject that. But what Coons wants to say is that, well, it's, like, it's more reasonable to accept that bridge principle and then just reject the initial assumption, right? The assumption that there are only finitely many prime numbers. And so in the case at hand, how that translates or how, how Coons wants to translate that, I think, um, is that we have a particular bridge principle, which is Coons's bridge principle, uh, and we have a particular initial assumption. So Kuhn's initial assumption is that um, there can be infinite causal regresses, or there's a possible world with infinitely many causal nodes, right? And then the bridge principle that he wants to have is if there can be an infinite causal regress and hence enough space and time in some framework world, right, to fit infinitely many Grim Reapers, and if a Grim Reaper is intrinsically specified is possible, if that's possible, well, then there's another possible world in which there are infinitely many duplicates of that Grim Reaper filling out those infinitely many causal nodes from the framework world. So he has that bridge principle. And together with that initial assumption, you get the contradiction. Now, what Coons wants to ask, or he wants us to ask is, which is it more reasonable to, re to reject, right? His bridge principle or that initial assumption? Coons thinks you should reject that initial assumption. Um, but I think what the UPDS wants to do here is say, no, we should reject the bridge principle or it, yeah, or something along those lines. Like we should reject the bridge principle either Maybe um, the bridge principle that he's using has certain provisos, right? So David Lewis on his Patrick principle, he knew that there were exceptions and he wanted to find general principles that explained, uh, or at least general features that explain why we have those exceptions. So he said space and geometry permitting, right? So he added provisos concerning space and geometry and so on. Um, but I don't see why we can't have still further provisos along the lines of provided that um, the patched up quilted world isn't, <laughs> the patched up quilted world doesn't instantiate some abstract structure, which is logically unsatisfiable or something along those lines. Um, I mean, I, don't, I just don't see why we can't include those as provisos. Again, I mean, I'm in the, I'm in the, I'm trying to find general explanations of why the Patrick principle fails in certain cases. Uh, and why can't I add that as a, a further proviso in addition to Lewis's? everyone recognizes that there are cases where there are going to be exceptions. And the general, I mean, what we have to do then is try to find explanations for that. Coons wants to say, well, it's only causal explanations. Um, but again, why can't we have a non-causal explanation in terms of abstract structure? Um, there are structural constraints on which worlds can be, which worlds are possible. Um, and we, I mean, I can walk you through the demonstration. I can walk you through the proof. And by my lights, that's a pretty illuminating explanation. It's an abstract explanation. It's a logical, it's an explanation in terms of structural constraints, but it's an explanation nonetheless, it seems to me. So yeah, that, that's kind of how I'm, how I'm seeing this. That, that sounds exactly right to me. Um, and it's not just that you're saying, oh, well, here's the constraint on the patchwork principle. Um, it can't lead to contradiction. Um, it's, it's a, a certain structure that inevitably does lead to contradiction and ruling out that structure is the constraint that, that you want to build in or that you want to say restricts the application of the patchwork principle. Did I say that clearly enough? I don't know. I think so. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that's right. And like, maybe it would be worth, and I don't know if you guys are fine with this, but maybe it would be worth looking at some potential exceptions to, to the Patrick principle and like seeing if they turn out to be causal, because that was something that like Coons's case arguably rested on, right? He's saying like, well, it works, right? The Patrick principle works unless you can get some kind of causal oomph, some kind of causal force that prevents the patched up world. Yeah, I think that was a, a crucial point in the in the discussion because um, it seemed to be 
it seemed to be something that was said without any uh, explanation for it. Like, why only causal, right? Um, so he certainly didn't say anything about that, apart from just deserting it. Um, and so you wonder why uh, maybe other types like a logical explanation or whatever yeah. might might be there. But um, I was wondering, well, take the case, uh, the Grim Punisher case, where you've got some instance of, you know, torturing or whatever, and you multiply that infinitely many times. Yeah, blah, I blah, wanted blah. to take this case. Go on. Um, now, that's supposed to be impossible for God to realize. Um but it struck me that that restriction can't really be cashed out as a causal constraint, right? Because I mean, exactly. why can't God do that, right? It, a causal constraint would be that there's some kind of like forces or something, and it's a mechanism or whatever that prevents that from taking place. But here the idea must be, well, we could take it in one of two ways, I suppose. One of them would be, it's metaphysically impossible for God to do that or something. Um, but then that strikes me as basically a logical constraint yeah. again, because you're just saying, X is metaphysically impossible. God can't do anything metaphysically impossible, from which it just follows by logic that he can't do it. And that doesn't seem like a causal explanation to me. The other way of putting it would be um, God is good, and that's like um, something he wouldn't allow. Yeah. But, you know, uh, it doesn't matter how good somebody is, right? The, their goodness can't be a causal explanation of why they don't do something bad. I mean, I'm sure Wes is a totally virtuous guy, right? But if, uh, if he restrains himself from doing something immoral that that's not cause i mean you know it seems an abuse of the word cause there it's like an explanation in terms of his virtue or something but i wouldn't call that a causal explanation so i didn't really understand if causal explanation is the only game in town how to make sense out of this idea that god uh it wouldn't allow evils of a certain nature to take place um yeah i don't know if this is a causal explanation but i i think the idea is that if there's a necessarily existent perfect being it would necessarily prevent this particular quilt <laughs> consisting in the eternal torture uh, from occurring um i i think that's that's the thought yeah. So there's since since this God, you know, whose essential properties are such that he necessarily prevents anything like that from being so, um, exists in every possible world. So there's no possible world in which you know that scenario is realized. Yeah. So so I... it's not a genuine possibility. The 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 catchphrase is God is a delimiter of possibilities. I, I, this is not a view that I'm fond of, but it's but it's a but it's a, a view that's quite common amongst theists. Mm, I guess it gets us into a kind of youth road position, though, because like uh, God, uh, His goodness is such that like doing or allowing those types of evils is certainly inconsistent with Him being good. Mm -hmm. But it's not clear to me that I mean that. So that just seems like it's a logical inconsistency that with the both obtaining well, like. well suppose that perfect love is is an essential feature of a necessarily existent and necessarily all-powerful being um then i mean arguably this scenario is incompatible with the existence of such a being but mm -hmm. this being exists in every possible world so the scenario is impossible I think that's the picture. Yeah, to me though, it doesn't seem like, like, yes, okay, God in some sense is causally responsible for the character of the world. And so he is in some sense causally preventing the world from being such that we have the eternal torture. But we have to ask, what's the explanation for that, right? The explanation is in terms of God's character. It's right, it's his essential love, goodness, perfection, whatever. Uh, and that seems to me to just be a kind of like, um, metaphysically necessary constraint on which worlds can be, right? Like which worlds there are. It's, it's the space of possible worlds. Um, those are constraints on the range of creations that it's even within God's power to like actualize in the first place, right? They constrain the range of, uh, like these, the essential constraints are explanatorily prior to any of God's causal acts because they delimit which causal acts God can perform to begin with, right? So, 
it doesn't seem to me that this is a causal explanation. It seems to me a non-causal explanation in terms of essential constraints. It's just part of the very nature of perfect love or part of the very nature of um, omnibenevolence. Well, wait a minute. Can, can there be a causal explanation of the absence of something um, that never occurs? That is also a good question. Um, I mean, I mean, on on this picture, um, it's the idea is that God, if if say there were some everlasting would be torturer, um, God would stop it, and that would be an exercise of God's power, and that certainly would arguably be causal, right? God would be causing him to stop. Um, I think, you know, Coons might just want to say that this is, you know, it just depends on how you want to use the word causal. I mean, God is this powerful being who would necessarily exercise his power in such a way as to prevent such a thing from occurring. And that's why it's not really possible. Yeah. Uh, see, I don't know. I, so I think you can you can make sense of like take someone say imagine someone who's infertile right now there's a causal explanation for their lack of children there that makes perfect sense to me i can understand in causal terms why they don't have any children it's because they lack the ability to, to reproduce um but when we're talking about this god situation it's not really supposed to be a lack of power in that sense i mean he has the ability to do anything metaphysically possible it's just that his being good means that he wouldn't make one of those things that is otherwise logically possible. Yeah, it's um, a metaphysically I'm necessary kind of, constraint. But it, it just seems to me it's, uh, it's just an incompatible, it's just a logical incompatible. Like if you're such that you would never do this, then it's also the case that it's not going to happen. You're not, you're not, you're not going to do it. It's just sort of like a logical truth. It's not, I'm not seeing a causal mechanism. Like you could refer to the kind of, uh, you know, more detail about the infertility of the person involved to explain in causal terms, why that's not possible. We're here we've just got this kind of fact that and maybe we can cash it out. Like if someone is perfectly good, then they wouldn't do such and such. It just seems more logical dressing up of this, right? I still don't see it as causal. I think the claim, the claim is stronger than that. It's that God okay. couldn't, couldn't do this. But there's no possible world in which God does permit such things. But the thing is, I don't think that there's any, like, why, right? We can ask, why is there no such possible world? Well, it's in terms of essential constraints, in terms of metaphysically necessary truths. None of those are, like, causing God to be unable to bring about uh, a world in which there's, you know, this, this torture world. Um, rather, it's just part of the very nature of, of his, part of the very nature of love, part of God's nature that he wouldn't do this. It, there's nothing that's like causing God to be unable to bring these sorts of things about. So we don't ultimately have a causal explanation here. It's an explanation in terms of metaphysically necessary constraints well, on the range of possible worlds. Well, so ultimately an explanation in terms of God's nature. Yeah. But then it goes contrary to Kuhn's claim that the only, the only exceptions are explained in terms of causal, something that causally, because here we're bottoming out an explanation of just, hey, it's metaphysically necessary uh, it, we just, in terms of metaphysically necessary constraints based on God's nature. Uh, that's not a causal explanation. So his explanation that he's proffering is not, after all, a causal explanation. But according to him, you can only have causal explanations of why we have exemptions to the Patrick principle. Well, here you've got a being who's, as it were, sitting there in eternity or wherever, who is quite ready to prevent you from doing this if you were so inclined. But you're not so inclined, so he doesn't exercise his power. So in that sense, it's not causal. But it, it seems to me that, you know, Coons might want to might want to be more careful with his terminology, but there's certainly a kind of force, uh, a power or something there that you can't, you know, you can't get prevents you from doing what you might be inclined to do. Yeah, I think that you can understand it in terms of like, why doesn't that happen? Um, and that God is like forcing events to turn out differently or something. So like, I, may, maybe, right? I don't know. Firstly, I mean, that seems very unlikely uh, to me because I've never 
seen that hand that stops gratuitous evils from taking place intervene in the world and prevent them it seems to me that there is no hand uh, intervening like that but let's just i can sort of understand that that's the case but but what i think i'm worried about is not so much uh is there some causal explanation of why they don't take place but is there some causal explanation of why god can't let them take place yeah yeah and that's the thing that strikes me as not having any causal explanation it's just he just is like that so there you go and it, it just bottoms out in some bit like brute yeah it's just metaphysically necessary not explained yeah, yeah. Uh, and i mean and, listen the, the updist yeah. i mean what i want to say is like hey if if yes there's some sense in which we have a causal explanation here but that causal explanation is itself further explained in terms of a non-causal explanation in terms of metaphysically necessary constraints based on god's nature the updist can similarly say they can say oh hey i actually have um, in some sense, a partly causal explanation for why the Patrick principle has an exception in the Benedetti constructions, right? They can say that part of the explanation of why these Benedetti constructions are impossible is that, you know, the collection of factors that causally brings about the infinite collection of reaper type mechanisms, that those factors causally produce them in a way in each possible world in an arrangement that fails to instantiate both the beginningless and property condition, right? And so we have a partly causal explanation of why no world includes these reaper type mechanisms instantiating a Benedetti paradox. But again, as with the theistic case, right? Um, there is a further explanation of why that collection of causal factors here doesn't causally bring about the Benedetti structure arranged in, in such and such a way. And that non further non-causal explanation is in terms of uh, the metaphysically necessary truth, let's say, of uh, the law of non-contradiction or something, or maybe we want to say it's a logically necessary truth or whatever. But my point is just that both the theist and the UPDist, in some sense, can have a causal explanation. But the thing is, that is undergirded by a non-causal explanation in terms of some kind of metaphysically necessary constraint on the range and character of possible worlds. And so ultimately, um, uh, Kuhn's either doesn't have uh, his desiderata, his desideratum here, because this is a non-causal explanation, uh, or if he thinks that he has a causal explanation, well, then the UPDS can simply say, oh, I also have a causal explanation. Um, yeah, sure. Uh, the, the further explanation of my own causal explanation is in terms of something non-causal, but the same is true of you. So that, that's what the UPDS can then say. Well, I guess God is is a, a separate category. Then <laughs> uh, here here's a here's a statement from Kuhn's um, in his exchange with Oppie in in that book I mentioned to you the, the other day. I posit exceptions to recombination principles like the patchwork principle, but only when those exceptions are entailed by well motivated motivated, motivated causal principles not on an ad hoc basis. So I, I, he might want to qualify that. <laughs> yeah, probably. I mean, I mean, like another thing that I wanted to say is like, there are so many of these different, um, there are so many different potential counterexamples to it. Um, and a lot of them are just going to be explained non-causally. I mean, a lot of, so, I mean, we can go through some of them, but like, Let's take like a case of um, uh, the case that I gave in the discussion, right? So Swan and uh, let's say God appears to Swan. And so we have one space time region where Swan has gotten into a yellow taxi already. And then in another disjoint space time region, let's say Jesus appears and, you know, utters some kind of sentence with his mouth and brain and so on. And the sentence is, um, this is another possible world you have never gotten into a primary colored vehicle or something along those lines. Now, both of these are obviously individually possible. They're disjoint space-time regions and they're both intrinsic, right? The, these are intrinsic specifications. So per Kuhn's Patrick principle, we should be able to patch in a third world where both of them happen together. Now that's absurd, right? Because uh, the resultant quilted world is not after all possible, uh, contrary to what the Kuhn's Patrick principle would say. Uh, because here we have a divine being revealing something false. Uh, and Coons is going to want to say that that's not possible. Uh, that's either going to involve some kind of deception on God's part or some kind of lying, uh, and God can't do those. So uh, we have here a, a case where the quilted world is not possible, despite the fact that we had enough, we had a framework world, we had the intrinsic individual possibilities and so on. So what's the explanation here? Well, 
the explanation seems to of what's the explanation here of why the Patrick principle disallows us to go from these individual possibilities and patch them together into a framework world. The explanation seems to be in terms of, um, hey, uh, God can't lie, right? Or something along those lines, like God can't falsely reveal something to someone. Um, but like, that is, again, that's just a metaphysically necessary truth about God's nature. Uh, nothing is like, causing God to be unable to lie or something along those lines. Uh, this is just, it's part of God's essential nature that he can't lie. Um, so sure, we have a concrete being and lying is a causal act and so on. But the fact that God can't lie, that's not some kind of, like that, that's not, we don't have a causal explanation here. This is a, a constraint. It's an essential constraint. It's similar to what we covered earlier. Yeah, I know, well, here I start to sort of, I'm, I'm not sure I see this very clearly though, because isn't this at the point where he started saying, well, you're assuming a naive application of the key schema and I reject that for other reasons anyway. So none of this semantic um, versions of the theory. Well, I suppose we're, we're not really talking about semantic versions of the theory now. Or are we? We're certainly talking about future orientated versions of the theory. Um, now, so maybe I'm changing the subject. Maybe his response here was just was similar to what you were saying that God just wouldn't. I mean, he said it was uh, restrictions on God's omniscience that you learn about from this, right? Although, to be honest, I I don't remember clearly enough what his the detail of what he said there, but. Well, that was for the, the future-oriented Benedetti paradoxes, which we might get into soon. But right now, I'm just looking at, like, different exceptions to the Patrick principle. And, like, um, a lot of them are going to be non-causal. So what his response here was that, well, actually, we have some kind of causal force that's somehow preventing uh, the, the Patrick principle from, from uh, preventing us to go to the quilted world, the, the resultant patched-up world. But what I want to say is, uh, no, we just end in some kind of metaphysically necessary truth that's the ultimate explanation and that's just a that's a that's just that's not a causal explanation on the the space of possible worlds of the character of possible worlds it's just an explanation in terms of natures or something along those lines in the character of natures um but Let's i mean we review review the counter example for a minute the the thought is sean has taken a taxi uh, jesus tells him that he's never taken a taxi. Uh, in another possible world. So in one possible world, we have an individual possibility. Uh, or we could take as our framework world, one in which, yeah, Swan has gotten into a, a, a yellow taxi, right? And we have enough space, let's suppose, in, in, in that framework world to patch in other individual possibilities. And so one other individual possibility is from another world where Swan has never actually gotten into a taxi. And God just decides to appear in that world and, and reveal to Swan that he's never gotten into a taxi or something along those lines. That's an individual possibility and we can intrinsically specify it because we can suppose that, uh, let's say God becomes incarnate in the form of Jesus and all these intrinsic facts about the brain structures and uh, the sentence utterances and so on. So, um, all, right, all right, Jesus is God. And, yeah, and... <laughs> yeah, basically. And, and so that's our individual possibility. We have a framework world and we just patch it in. And then because you, you get a- And so God has a spatial temporal location. Um, yeah, or at least, or at least Jesus would. Well, <laughs> AKA. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and, and the result is is that you get a false revelation, which uh, theists don't tr traditionally don't like, uh, and that's not going to be possible for them. They're not going to say no. God can't lie or deceive or anything along those lines, uh, and so we get an absurdity in the resultant patched up world. Uh, it, the quilted world is not, after all, going to be a possible world, despite the fact that the the Patrick principle that Coons uses would entail that it's a possible world. Uh, now, Coons would try to say, oh, well, we have an exception here because we have a causal explanation. But what I want to say is, no, you don't actually have a causal explanation. Or if you do, the ultimate explanation of that partly causal explanation, the ultimate explanation of that is in terms of essential character and so, just facts about natures. I'm, I'm just having trouble with this. What are the intense, intrinsic properties, the relevant intrinsic properties of this Jesus? The the one we're patching in. Yeah, so, I mean, we could do, I mean, just, I he don't has know, just beliefs. He has beliefs yeah. about beliefs. We could just talk about a belief, say, and so maybe he would have a false belief. That's one thing you could do. Or you could just say, like, you know, he, um, he utters something or whatever. You know, he, he 
he, he says something he does he gives some kind of revelation he uses his mouth and so on and uh like i'm doing right here now of course that like reaching you in some way that that's that's an extrinsic fact but well um, on his beliefs uh his his infallible beliefs already an extrinsic relation i mean you're not that's talking where, about that's where i was going well hmm. I mean, it depends upon the, well, it depends upon the nature of the belief. I mean, if it's just an extrinsic relation to the facts themselves, I mean, he could just like think to himself in his own mind, right? Uh, like, you know, I, I just thought to myself something and that seems to be yeah, intrinsic but, to me. But then uh, there's no um, sense but, in which you can describe them as infallible unless you describe them as being true. And that seems to be having a relationship to how things are outside your mind and your own beliefs, right? Well, that the, the infallibility just follows from the, the the nature that he is. So yeah, certain extrinsic facts will follow from intrinsic specifications of a situation, just as my existing a lot in a world in which one plus one equals two is an extrinsic fact about me. But that, you know, yeah, that follows from certain other intrinsic facts, but I can just give you an intrinsic specification of the situation that he just thinks in his own mind, uh, you know, Swan has never gotten into such a taxi or something like that, you know, um, and then I patch that in. So yeah, sure. If you like, the infallibility that's an extrinsic fact but um but i mean like if you say look, joe is thinking that wes is in colorado um that can be purely intrinsic but if you say joe is right in thinking that wes is in colorado now you can't con construe that as being purely and intrinsically describing joe yeah it's not now i mean yeah but i'm not saying so that he's right i'm just saying he's thinking it right so i'm just giving you an intrinsic specification of the situation and of course it follows from the fact that he's God, that he is going to be right. But like, I'm just specifying the intrinsic facts about him and I'm patching, I'm taking those intrinsic facts and patching them elsewhere. It follows from his being God that yeah, he's gonna be right. But I'm not using that as part of what I'm patching in and trying to keep constant. But I rather... think that that, I think that, it, yeah, I think that it violates the, the, the intrinsic the, the, If you Sorry, don't but... patch that in, then there's no inconsistency. Is there? Or... Well, I mean, he has his nature essentially, right? And intrinsically, arguably. And yeah, certain extrinsic facts are going to follow from that. I mean, again, like Coons is patching in certain Reapers and so on in their intrinsic specifications, but th those intrinsic specifications are going to have all sorts of extrinsic entailments, right? Like existing uh, in a world in which one plus one equals two, or, you know, those sorts of things. So yeah, there, there are extrinsic entailments, but all you need to do is specify them intrinsically and patch their intrinsic properties and so on into another world. And whatever's entailed, whatever extrinsic properties are entailed or, you know, tag along with that. Yeah, those will go along with it. But um, I, I'm not really seeing any, any problem here because I'm just specifying that he thinks intrinsically such and such. And he's also intrinsically God, right? That's his nature or whatever. And so I'm just patching him. So with his nature, and I'm also patching that intrinsic fact about his belief into another world. It follows from his nature that it's going to be right, right? But uh, that's just like how it follows from, uh, you know, the nature of the Grim Reapers that uh, certain extrinsic facts are true of them. Uh, and that's also going to be true in the patched up world, like that they exist in a world that one plus one equals two. Well, I think both Wes and I are maybe confused about the nature of uh, how the intrinsicality is supposed to work in this con context. Um, I mean, we spoke about it before. Um, I don't want to say that Wes is confused. I feel confused anyway. Um, no, I'm me too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, so I think the way Coons is thinking about intrinsicality is the same. It's kind of Lewisian way. So you're saying like uh, duplicates in in different worlds uh, are intrinsically the same. If um, oh, damn it, I forget exactly what the formula is, but it's about duplicates in other worlds having the same properties that, that that doesn't feel right so i need to go back to read plurality again but i'm sure it's a lewisian notion of intrinsicality that coons is using and um i don't know it just doesn't click with me but look i do think that this example really does play on the t schema stuff because why don't we just make the example much simpler right there's some world where god says what's written on this piece of paper is true and he's on the piece of paper is a sentence that says this sentence is true and then there's some other world where there's just a piece of paper that says this sentence is false and now you just patch them together 
God saying what's written on this piece of paper is true, but patch in the piece of paper which says this sentence is false. And now you've got a contradiction or something seemingly, right? Because you've got a kind of instance of the liar paradox. Um, and Kuhn's reply is to say, yeah, but I mean, that doesn't show you that God can't exist or anything metaphysical because it assumes um, that you can apply the T-schema sort of naively, how he'd put it. And he rejects that anyway for independent reasons. So it seems to me if he can, that's why he was saying, you know, just because I can print a T-shirt with this, what's written on the front is false and what's written on the back is true or whatever, doesn't mean T-shirts are impossible. Hmm. Um, so it does. I just think that if he's taking that line, then all of this other stuff about like, well, what maybe God could whisper in your ear and tell you blah, blah, blah. And we're wondering about whether God can lie and blah, blah. It doesn't really matter because he's going to say, look, I just don't buy the T schema in all of these cases anyway. So it, if all you're relying on is some kind of like logical thing there, I mean, it's interesting to me that he would, you know, on the one hand, the T scheme is very plausible looking. I mean, you have to do a lot of work before you can get to the point of rejecting it and, and make, making sense of that. Um, although, you know, loads of people do, there's, you know, whatever, it's, it's a move lots of people make. Um, on the other hand, uh, because he'd say, well, you're not going to make a metaphysical concession like T-shirts are impossible. That would be crazy. So I'll reject, you know, or at least nuance my acceptance of a otherwise plausible looking kind of logical principle like the T-schema. Very similar, really, to saying, well, uh, I'm not going to like reject beginningless uh, sequences. I'm just going to like restrict or nuance the use of an otherwise plausible looking epistemological principle, like a patchwork principle. I know. It's very, very similar <laughs> on its face, right? It's kind of symmetry between those two positions. But my point is really just, I think a lot of this, if you're talking to him about it and he's taking that view on semantics, then it, it's sort of pointless bringing them up unless you want to deal in particular with his view, his like contextualism about um the liar paradox and knowing next to nothing about his position although i'm sure it's i'm sure it's very cogent and well worked through um it just sort of feels like it's a bit of a stalemate to go anywhere near those um at least I, that's my view i don't know i don't know what you guys think about that yeah i mean so what i was thinking is that in that other possible world in which god reveals something true to someone else um okay so he, he i mean coons thinks that well, okay. I thought that Coons thinks that uh, the T schema holds for at least some sentences, right? Yeah. Um, and some things, right? Uh, and so there's, I don't see why we can't have a one world in which God reveals something true to someone or whispers in their ear or, you know, something along those lines, or, you know, maybe Jesus is thinking something. Uh, and the T schema does hold of it in that world. Uh, and there, no, nothing would there's nothing that would entail contradictions in that world or anything of that sort. So the T-schema does hold of it in that world. And because we have that as an individual possibility, we just pass that into another world. And per the Patrick principle, we should be able to preserve the T-schema holding of that, assuming that it's an intrinsic fact about the yeah, sentence exactly. utterance and so on, which might, it might, not be, right. it might no, not be an intrinsic fact about it. It could be an extrinsic fact. But I think he would deny that you can sort of bring with you the application of T-schema in one context or another one. It depends on whether or not it's an intrinsic fact. Because if it is an intrinsic fact, then you then his Patrick principle entails that you can bring it with you. Uh, but if it's an extrinsic fact, then his principle would not entail that. So it depends on whether or not the T C whether or no, not. No, I don't think that's right either. I think his Patrick principle is only in, interested in intrinsic causal powers. It's not it's not about intrinsic in a kind of logical sense. I think oh, that might be right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So That's... I think his view is that um, the application of the T schema is kind of contextually determined, and he's okay. going to have some way of drawing that line, which means basically summarizing in such a way that, like, I'm not sure this is exactly right, but the output must be something like T schema in certain contexts, like liar like contexts, is where it breaks down. Presumably, there's more to it than that, but having literally just skimmed. Uh, little bits of that book I don't I don't know enough and it's very technical and it's actually not it's mainly not about that it's, so it sort of uses uh, that but it's it's about lots of other things in the same at the same time 
Um, yeah, so I, uh, it's difficult to say much more about it, especially because he was very confident with you that, like, definitely I've sorted this out, spent 15 years on it. I know. Shut up. You know, I know that <laughs> go was, that away. Was <laughs> I'm so, like, okay, you haven't yeah. really convinced a lot of other philosophers, but that's, you know, let's set that aside. I mean, yeah, that's the thing. There's so many people have worked on that area and many of them for similar periods of time and many of them just as well qualified as as Rob is to make those claims that it's, you know, it's, it's difficult to make it a sort of basically an appeal to authority in that case. Like I've done this, I've worked it all out. I'm not going to tell you any of the answers, but just trust me, I've worked it through because you just wheel out someone else who's worked it through and came to a different position than him. So um, I think we, we really did need to know a bit more about, about what he meant there. Um, yeah, no, but that's good about the, the causal thing. So I, I'll keep that in mind because that's a point well taken about the, the causally intrinsic facts about the situation. So yeah. Um, okay. Here's, a, here's his definition of, uh, of intrinsicality from the 2014 newspaper. Mm-hmm. A property is intrinsic to a thing X within region R in world W, if and only if X is P throughout R in W, and every counterpart of X in any region R of world W whose contents exactly duplicate the contents of R and W um, also has P throughout R. Yeah, okay. So it is saying every duplicate shares the same properties. So every counterpart, every counterpart has these properties and exists in a region that exactly, whose contents exactly duplicate the, mm-hmm. the contents of this region. I mean, I have to admit, like, the duplication stuff so, is difficult for me because, I don't know, I, it seems to me to presuppose intrinsicality. Like, uh, what is a duplicate, uh, if not something that just shares? I mean, I don't know, my concept of duplication seems to be parasitic on it's sharing all and only the same intrinsic features. Um, so that that's that's always what gets me about the kind of duplicacy definitions or analyses of intrinsicality. But what, what, what about my earlier worry about the, the success condition? I mean, he has to assume that each of these, each of these signalers or reapers or whatever the example is, he has to assume that each of them is successful, right? Um, I mean, I'm thinking so, maybe, maybe he'd be able to construct a Benedetti scenario where success is solely a function of the intrinsic properties of it. So like, you know, he has the, like the point size particle ones, so like maybe we can specify some kind of spatio temporal region where it's just the intrinsic facts of the thing that determine whether or not it succeeds, you know, it just like, well, I don't know. It's, it's the, it's the intrinsic character of the, of the thing and the region it occupies plus the intrinsic character and the contents of the region that adjoins it, right? Containing another of these signalers or reapers, right? Um, yeah. But I, I guess he's thinking <laughs> that, those, that they, they, those two together entail success. Other, otherwise, I don't know how to understand it because success seems to take us outside the region, right? Because it requires that a signal be picked up or sent from a separate region. Well, suppose that, uh, suppose that the region is just like the size of my room and that there's just like a particle or okay, maybe there's a floating orb uh, with like a, <laughs> some kind of on off switch. Okay, so there's a floating orb over there with an on off switch and like all that the Reaper has to do, and this is all contained within the, this, the space-time region, is just go and like flip the orb up or down. Uh, so whether or not the thing succeeds in that, the Reaper succeeds in that, seems to just be a function of the intrinsic facts of the whole region, the space-time region. Yeah, but, yeah, but, but this has to be echoed in the adjoining region. Yeah. Yeah, so right. we'd be able to duplicate this intrinsic. The reaper, region. the reaper, the preceding and the succeeding reapers have to receive this signal, and success has to do with getting the signal through. 
Yeah, but like it's uh, not enough. Just it's not enough. Just inside your own room, you've successfully flipped the switch. That has to be replicated mm. for the Reaper in the next room. Yeah, but the Reaper in the next room can just look whether or not it's on or off. So like what what they could do is like the means by which you send and detect whether or not the the signal has been sent is just whether or not the orb is on or off, right? So like we yeah, can but, say that. But you're yeah, still talking about the contents of a different region of space time. You know, maybe the switch is a space-time worm and this portion of the worm is in your region and that portion of the worm is in his region. If the intrinsic features yeah. are all wholly contained within your region, then success, which requires some sort of replication in the adjoining region, is extrinsic. Okay, so yeah, success that's would require... The, that's the worry. Yeah, so it would require the persistence of whatever I... If I turn it on or off, let's say, it would have to be off going from my region all the way through until their region as well, right? So, like, that is the signal that you're talking about, and that's trans-regional in some sense. It's a persistent, like, state of affairs, and that seems to be extrinsic. To, well, extrinsic could, to the particular space-time region. Why couldn't there be a counterpart to you and your room in another possible world um, where, you know, there's some reaper or other, some signal or other in the next room, um, but his contents don't match up with yours. So you don't succeed. Mm, yeah, like think of um, uh, someone who's trying to send a smoke signal, right? And a successful smoke signaler can't be an intrinsic property, even if uh, you have a chain of people who see a so smoke signal on the horizon, make their own one, next guy sees a smoke signal on the horizon, makes his own one. Because the definition is just that um, any duplicate uh, in a similar space-time region uh, would, um, that the property is intrinsic uh, only if any duplicate has that property. Right, but you can imagine a duplicate in a world where there aren't any other uh, smoke signalers. And in that case, he can't be successful. He can still be a smoke signaler. He can do exactly the same things. But being a successful one means that there has to be other people around him. So it seems to me that using the definition of intrinsicality in Coons, you, you the smoke signaler, the successful smoke signaler, right? That's what your that's that's your point, I think, Wes. Isn't it the like success condition built into it? Uh, means more than just duplicating the kind of local properties around what you're doing, whether it's sending a signal of any type or passing a note or, or whatever. It does require um, facts beyond the space-time region in which you're in, right? That include here's, other things as well. Here's another Kuhn's quote that, that's relevant. Um, he says that he speaks of the passive power of receiving any signal sent by a predecessor, if there is in fact one, right? And the active power of sending a signal uh, to a, a successor signaler, again, if there is one. This pair of passive and active powers is intrinsic to each grim signaler. So he's trying to, he's trying to make the description of the individual patches completely intrinsic, mm. right? Um, but the trouble is that that's not enough to give you success. Mm -hmm. I mean, even, you know, there could be, suppose there is another signaler in the next region, right? Um, the intrinsic properties of me and my region don't guarantee that he's going to get the signal. Yeah, exactly. Because a duplicate could be on his own and nobody's getting So it looks signal. like success isn't intrinsic. Yeah, that um, seems right. So here's, here's one more quote. This is, these are all from the 2014 article. It says, let's assume that whether or not a power is exercised successfully and whether or not some disposition is followed in exercising it is a matter intrinsic to the situation in which the exercise occurs. So, you know, what situation 
what's that? Is that, that seems, the pair? That seems that to smuggle in the singlers, yeah, a triplet of singlers. Um, we seem to be outside the region of just a single signal. That's interesting. So there's there's something there's something there that doesn't seem quite right. So, um, in his book, the ninety three book, I think he uses the notion of situation in a technical sense to build the contextualism that he has with the liar paradox. So I think there may be some kind of um, use of language that we're not picking up on particularly well here, given it just strikes me that I well, think he's got some kind of historical. Well, either situation includes more than one of them, or it just includes, mm. you know, the one in its space-time region. If it just includes the one in its space-time region, then we don't truly have success. If it includes more than one, then it seems to be at least extrinsic to that particular one, right? Um, so I don't really, I don't think it turns on the his precise yeah, analysis not. of situation. He's he is in the passage I just read. He's trying to respond to an objection that he anticipates. And the objection is that the signalers could fail. That the, <laughs> right? Of course, yeah. they in in this imagine imaginary case, some of them will fail. Lots of them will fail. I mean, they have to because it's an unsatisfiable pair. Mm. <laughs> um, but but I mean, this is what it. it for me, I mean, maybe I'm maybe I am a naive applier of the T schema on some level. I don't know, uh, but it seems to me that the you know the the bridges of Königsberg example is really helpful f for me. Anyway, understanding this type of thing because like you're not going to succeed in crossing all of those bridges uh, and without doubling back on yourself, um, you are going to fail somehow, um, and that seems the right thing to say about these signalers. Um, either there aren't infinitely many of them or there are infinitely many, but one of them at least fails or loads of them fail or something. But, you know, these, these are the only types of consistent stories you can tell that sort of broadly match the, the premises of the setup. You can't have all of the premises of the setup or else your, your situation is not consistent. You know, if, if you set it up such that there's seven bridges, um, then I think that's all you need, in fact, is seven bridges then you're not going to be able to cross them over without doubling back on yourself. And that's it. So like, um, if you want to know something consistent that's similar to you doing that, uh, I can tell you loads of stories, you know, this one fails, that one fails or whatever, but uh, obviously we know that they're not all going to succeed. Uh, it just feels right to me. Uh, then again, I might be, I might be naive in some respect that I'm not aware of. I doubt it's it. Possible. <laughs> <laughs> it's always possible. Of course. Maybe it's worth now going on to like the future oriented Benedetti paradox, not the semantic one, but um, the one with God's knowledge um, to talk about that. Uh, so one thing that, um, well, it was a bit odd in the discussion and this is just uh, an aside, but it, it's, a, it's a bit odd because Kuhn said that if God has foreknowledge and I'm, I'm quoting here, uh, it's because his internal states are causally posterior to something that's in the future. Okay, that, that's that's one quote. But then later on, he went to say that he doesn't think God is causally affected by anything. Um, so that was a bit odd. I guess charitably interpreted, maybe earlier he was just um, just not stating his own view. Uh, and but later, so late because he accepts divine impassibility, right? So he does he doesn't think that God can be causally affected in any way, shape, or form. Uh, but Earlier, he said that God's internal states are causally posterior to something that's in the future. Um, so, again, I, I think charitably interpreted what he said there at the, uh, about the causal posteriority is maybe just not a reflection of his view. Um, but I don't know. Uh, that, that, that was just a preliminary remark on the, the, Benner, the future oriented Benedetti paradoxes. I just thought that that was a bit odd. Um, maybe you guys, I don't know if you guys have any ruminations on that, but. I'm not sure I do have much to say about that. I mean, um, I think I'm less interested once 
the conversation just becomes about theology and like what yeah. the model of God is and all oh, right, you know, you can just make up any any old model then, I guess. And it and then, you know, the human imagination is limitless. Um and it stops being interesting trying to sort of work the things through. For it to be interesting, the parameters have to be quite tight, it seems to me. But once we're just discussing can God do X or Y, I mean, if I, I guess I, I'm I'm less interested then. Um Yeah. Okay. If well, we leave if we leave God out of it. Isn't the issue just about backwards causation? I mean, he just says it's not possible. Yeah. I mean, if 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 Reaper A could be, you know, could be sensitive to what Reaper B, his successor, is doing or will do, um, then you could have a future-oriented um, Grim Reaper scenario that would yield exactly the same. Hmm. Well, the no, same contradiction. Well, he said that when God has foreknowledge and reveals something to someone about what happens in the future, God is making the future thing cause the earlier thing to happen. That's what Kuhn said in the discussion. So he is okay with the kind of backwards causation in that sense. Now, uh, what's troubling here is that uh, when I gave the paradox, the future oriented Benedetti paradox, he said that God, this is a quote, he said, God cannot create the situation you described because it would violate causal finitism. Okay, now I want to, I want to focus, I want to oh, zoom in quest, on this. That's question begging. Yes, no, I know. <laughs> that, I, I want to zoom in on this. So there are a number of things to say here. The first thing to say is that, um, right, the Patrick principle that he used simply entails that this would be possible, right? I took a framework world with an endless future which Coons grants is possible. And then I, I then took an individually possible patch, namely an angel that implements the following rule, like write my number on the paper, if and only if uh, the angel tomorrow doesn't write his number on the paper, right? That's, uh, that's just like the Reaper mechanism. Uh, and then I duplicated that patch into the framework world. Now by the Patrick principle, it simply follows that the resultant patched up world, the quilted world must be possible. And yet it isn't since it instantiates the unsatisfiable pair. And so since Coons grants that that individual angel of the kind I specified is possible, it simply follows that there cannot be that framework world. It's the same sort of inference with an endless future uh, or else the Patrick principle is false, right? Because Patrick principle is what we took us there. Now, what Coons might try to do is he might try to defeasibilize or make defeasible the Patrick principle and then say we have an exception in this case. Um, uh, and the defeater or the reason is causal finitism. But then I think that there are a number of difficulties with this. Uh, I think he would be then succumbing to the exact same point missing that he accused the UPDist of, right? The point is that if we have a framework world with an endless future, then we could construct a possible violation of causal finitism by means of the Patrick principle. And since that's not possible by Kuhn's lights, it follows that the original world isn't possible after all, and hence the future cannot be infinite. Um, and moreover, I mean, I can just equally well say that there can't be a situation of the, of the kind Kuhn's described because it would violate the law of non-contradiction or something along those lines. And so we have an exception in that case. And the defeater would be the law of non-contradiction or the metaphysically necessary truth of the law of non-contradiction. And now we're going back to some things that Kuhn said earlier, right? Oh, what is causal finitism like some mysterious force that's like, you know, sticking its tentacles in the world and preventing infinite causal chains from obtaining? No, um, he, Kuhn's is here again, not giving a causal explanation firstly, um, but moreover, we face these particular problems. And to your point, Wes, when you said question begging, yeah, let's think about the dialectical context. The truth of causal finitism is the very very question at issue in this dialectical context. And so it doesn't count as an independent reason to defeat the Patrick principle in this case. We are trying in this context to find out whether causal finitism is true. And so it doesn't count as something antecedently independently motivated and so liable to defeat the application of the Patrick principle on this occasion, right? Coons was, I mean, Coons said in the discussion that like, yeah, you would need some kind of independent reason in favor of your initial hypothesis in order to defeat the application of the Patrick principle to that initial hypothesis when you get a resultant world that's, that's contradictory, if you want to make an, uh, an exception to the Patrick principle. Um, but that just means that Coons would already have to have independent reasons to think that causal finitism is true to, to block this. And yet that's the very question at issue in this dialectical context. Um, I mean, to, and I guess I'll turn it over to you guys right after I say this final thing. Um, like to put it differently, I can use the Patrick principle in the future-oriented angelic paradox 
to deliver the falsity of causal finitism, uh, but Coons can use the Patrick principle to deliver the truth of causal finitism. And so why we should we prefer Coons's application of the Patrick principle over my application? Um, appealing to causal finitism itself obviously won't do here. Um, that's the very question at issue. So yeah, I wonder what you guys think about that. Well, um, I, I don't know. So uh, thinking aloud, I mean, if that's right, in the original case, um, you, Kuhn's wants to say, sure, there are causal finitism is a restriction on the patchwork principle um, in the normal um, Grim Reaper case. Um, is that question begging? I mean, isn't it supposed to be an argument for causal finitism? And, but aren't we saying something like, well, the reason the paradox can't occur is because of causal finitism. And it, it seems to be very similar. And actually now you've put it like that. I wonder whether, well, the, are, we, are you saying, or are we saying that the original uh, claim then is, is question begging too? Or I, I, maybe I'm misunderstanding something. Uh, it's late night here, so. Yeah, so what I was so, thinking. No. What I was thinking is that we have uh, a frame, we have framework worlds, right? And then we make patches of individual possibilities into those framework worlds. And given the Patrick principle, we conclude that the quilted resultant world is possible. Okay, now if we have that, well then we can take individual possibilities and quilt up a world in which, uh, let's say, the, the future instantiates that kind of Benedetti paradox. Yeah, or the original one where the past instantiates. Yeah, where, where the past instantiates it. Now, um, what what we what, what Coons wants to conclude is that hey, well then you can't have the original kind of framework world. Well, what I want to say there is then that you can't have the original framework world with an endless future. Now, what he was going to want to say is that oh well, no, I mean you can't have infinitely many causal nodes impacting one target state. But then the question is right. I had a framework world which Kuhn's grants is possible. And then I duplicate things which are individually possible to then conclude that there is a possible world using the Patrick principle to conclude that there's a possible world in which causal finitism is false. Uh, and we could just focus on like a benign situation. It doesn't even have to be the, the like a Reaper style situation. And so given the Patrick principle, we would be able to conclude that causal finitism is false. Now, Kuhn's wants to make an exception in that case, of course, right? Uh, so he wants to make an exception to that. Well, what's, what's his exception? Well, the reason is causal finitism. That's, that's why um, he says he, the resultant quilted world is not possible. And the reason we have uh, an exception to the Patrick principle here okay, is because yeah. of causal finitism. Now, the thing is, right? Kuhn said earlier that you need some kind of independent, you need independent reason to favor the initial hypothesis uh, or you need some kind of independent reason for whatever you're conjoining to the Patrick principle that delivers a contradiction. You need some independent reason if you want to carve out an exception for that hypothesis when you apply the Patrick principle to it and you get a contradiction, if you want to restrict the Patrick principle in, in some kind of manner. And so again, Coons is wanting to restrict it. And so he has to have an independent reason for, the, uh, for restricting it in the manner that he does. And causal finitism is the hypothesis that he wants to save as it were. So he needs an independent reason for causal finitism, right? Uh, but like, that there's no antecedently given independent reason for causal finitism in this dialectical context. This was supposed to be his argument for causal finitism. There's no antecedently justified fact that serves as an independent reason as to why we have an exception to the Patrick principle in this case. So um, he would already have to be justified in accepting causal finitism in order to avoid my application of the Patrick principle as it were in this case. And like, that's the very question at issue as to whether or not causal finitism is true. So it's like in order to avoid the problematic applications of the, the very Patrick principle that he's using in his argument, uh, he would already have to have a pre-given reason to think that causal finitism is true. But you think that that applies, that criticism applies to the original case just as much as the future pointing case? Well, because it, it, what, the way you've described it there is so abstract, it doesn't really have anything to do with whether the original example is future pointing or backwards pointing. So I'm just trying to get clear whether you're making a more general claim here that in the, even in the, the dialectic, case. In, the, in this dialectic, the difference is that in the future oriented case, Kuhn's is prepared to grant that there's 
enough there's a possible world with enough space mm -hmm. enough oh, room for the for all the patches and he grants that the patches are individually possible so you use his own patrick principle to deliver the falsity of causal finitism and remember he says you can only make an exception to this if you uh well, he, he says different things. Uh, you could only make an exception to this if you have a, a, some kind of causal explanation, firstly. That's one thing that he says. But also, if you have an independent reason for the original hypothesis, which was... The, so, okay, we have an initial assumption, right? Remember Euclid's proof. We have that initial assumption that there's a, an infinite number uh, or there's a finite number of primes. And then we have the bridge principle that takes us from that initial assumption to an absurdity. Similarly, with Kuhn's, you have an initial uh, hypothesis or an initial assumption that there's a, an infinite causal chain or a framework world. Uh, and then you uh, use your bridge principle, which is the Patrick principle, to deliver an absurdity. Now, what Coons wants to say is that, oh, well, then you can't have that framework world. But like, Coons already grants that there's the framework world in, in the, the future case, right? Uh, and we have the individual possibility and we have this bridge premise. So we just get the falsity of causal finitism from this. And so if he wants to carve out an exception to the Patrick principle, it's like, okay, well, the Patrick principle fails here. Okay, you can't apply it here because causal finitism is true, right? But Remember, I, I wanted to say, oh, you can't apply the Patrick principle to this Benedetti type case because uh, the unsatisfiable paradiagnosis is true and you just have a logical contradiction. He's saying, no, 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 that doesn't work. You have to have an independent reason for thinking that uh, that framework world is possible. Well then, okay, now we need to have an independent reason to think that um, in favor of Kuhn's uh, initial hypothesis or whatever. Um, and it, that's like the very thing, that's the very question at issue, right? So. It's, an ab it's, a, it's a difficult dialectic to follow, and I'm still trying to work through it myself. Um, but uh... Well, one simpler point, uh, it seemed to me, was that if you have to make um, exceptions to the patchwork principle, for instance, when you say, well, um, uh, recombinations of suffering, um, which are otherwise consistent, um, are impossible if God exists, um, then it does seem to me that that, that that understanding of how the Patrick principle works is dubious to use if you are, because he said, well, it's not question begging here because um, you don't need to presuppose God for your argument that cause of finitism is true. Uh, you just need to presuppose God for your argument that infinite suffering is impossible, um, but that's okay, and cleaved the, the, the dialectic, or this bit of the dialectic apart. But it seems to me if you're using the Grim Reaper argument as a kind of Kalam uh, premise, which Craig seems to be all, yeah. all up for these days, and, and Coons even has a section in that 2020 paper where he talks about it as a Kalam argument. Um, but it does seem to me there you shouldn't really be presupposing frameworks that uh, that require um, God to be there to get out of the awkward cases. Um, so I, I do think that, that there was that bit of a debate where he was very, very, he, in fact, he was, it, it was one of those bits where you were saying, okay, well, there's a problem here. And he go, no, there isn't. And you go, okay, well, let me just finish what I'm saying. Really, really isn't there. And it was like, it was, I know. All right, just calm down a minute. <laughs> you know, exactly, like, Can you just I, mute him? Someone yeah, mute this guy. Let dude, me I got so many messages from people like that. I don't even know. They're like, Joe, I mean, that was, I'm sorry that you had to go through that. I'm like, yeah, but go on. Well, it wasn't, it certainly wasn't the worst interview you've had to suffer through. That's very um, true. Which we well. all know is the <laughs> certain different person, but yeah, I don't know. So I think I, I, I'm going to have to probably call it a night more or less now, but I don't mean that the, you guys can keep speaking because no. the sun is still shining in behind where's his head there. But um, Yo, can uh, I make one last point before you leave? Um, okay, it's just cool. like, he, here's another way to think about it, right? So we have two applications of the Patrick principle and like antecedent to even considering whether or not atheism or theism is true, like, like, right? Like, in one of them, I conclude that, uh, let's say, theism is false because I use the Patrick principle to get all these, uh, this infinite suffering and so on. And in another one, Coons uses it to get causal finitism, and let's just suppose causal finitism entails theism, which he, he thinks it very strongly, plausibly leads to it. So, uh, so in one case, I use it to get to atheism. In one case, he uses it to get to theism. Um, 
what non-question begging reason is there to prefer one application over the other, right? He, Coons might say, oh, well, you know, I have reasons in favor of theism and that defeats your application of the Patrick principle. But like I can say, oh no, I have reasons in favor of atheism, partly because I use this Patrick principle to give me that to defeat your application of the Patrick <laughs> principle. And so like, uh, like his reason, let's suppose that this is the only reason on the table when we're considering for theism, his reason for being a theist is precisely using this Patrick principle to get you causal theism and then to get you theism. Now, suppose my reason for being an atheist is to use the Patrick principle to get me this world of suffering and hence atheism. Now it's going to be no, it's going to be no use for him to say, oh, well, God exists. And so that's an exception to your principle. No, I could say, oh, no, God doesn't exist. That's an exception to your Patrick principle because I use my own Patrick <laughs> principle. That's, that's, I think, the best way to put the kind of question begging dialectic. We both can use our applications of the Patrick principle to get these incompatible conclusions. Why should I privilege yours over mine? Uh, to, and he's trying to, it's like he's almost trying to use the conclusion that he's getting from his Patrick principle to say, oh, well, that serves as a defeater for your Patrick principle. Like, I could do the same thing. Mm-hmm. So anyway, I wanted to, th- th- I think that's a clearer way to put the question begging point. That's a much clearer way. Like earlier, I was just saying like, oh, you'd already have to have independent reason and so on. But I think that's a clearer way to put it. Um, yeah. Well, that's probably a good place to leave it. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, um, I guess uh, any, any final words before I click stop recording? Uh, thank you guys both for coming on. I've enjoyed oh. this. We, we did definitely got into the weeds and yeah. Any final words? Yes. No. <laughs> It's yeah, a very enjoyable, fun conversation. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, <laughs> Thanks very uh, much. Thanks. I'm, sh- I'm sure I'll have you guys on at some point in the future, but uh, what better way to end is there than I'm Joe Schmidt. This is the majesty of reason and peace out. Okay, so here's the document that contains my notes on the discussion that I had with Rob Coons. So here are just some preliminary notes, but now on to basically the opening stuff that Coons said. And again, these comments are not going to be fully exhaustive, and I'm not going to go through the, what the UPD is and so on. Check out my column playlist for that, right? I'm assuming a lot of background here. So we're kind of thrown into the weeds uh, in this video, but you're just going to have to deal with that. If you, if you haven't read up on that or listened up on that, I highly recommend doing so, because this is going to assume that you know what the UPD is, what Benedetti paradoxes are, what the logically unsatisfiable pair is, and so on. So first, Kuhn said that there's no reason to think an infinite causal regress is possible. Now, I think that that's mistaken for six reasons. Now, some of these reasons are going to be contestable. And, you know, some people might not think that ultimately they provide much or any support for the possibility of infinite causal regresses. But to say that these are not reasons whatsoever, that just strikes me as false. It strikes me as clearly false, in fact. So again, we might express some doubt about how much evidence that these provide for possibility, uh, but also arguably, or at least a number of them provide defeasible evidence for possibility. So first is conceivability. It seems eminently conceivable that let's say the past could be infinite or that we could have infinite causal regresses. We also have a kind of possibilized induction, right? So if all A's in our experience are B, that gives us some reason to think that all A's are at least possibly B. And so given that every day that we've experienced is such that it's preceded by a day before it, or we could run this with seconds or whatever, that gives us some reason to think that, hey, it's possible that all seconds are preceded by another second, or it's possible that all days are preceded by another day. And that is the distributive sense of the universal quantifier there for people who are thinking that I'm trying to quantify over all of them collectively. No, I'm just talking about each and every one of them. It's possible for each and every one of them to have a predecessor day. Again, I'm not claiming that this proves that infinite causal regresses are possible. I'm just saying this gives us some defeasible weight of a reason, even if very minor, gives us some defeasible weight of a reason for the possibility of infinite causal regresses. Moreover, we can appeal to modal seemings, right? Perhaps it seems to someone the case that, you, yeah, you could have a perfectly benign, non-Benardetti infinite causal chain. There are also versions of the Patrick principle that allow us to multiply spatiotemporal regions themselves. That is, they allow us to take individually and intrinsically specified spatiotemporal regions and then to multiply those adjacently next to one another in a non-overlapping way, however much we want. If we can do that, well, then we can multiply spatiotemporal regions themselves such that we patch up a beginningless past, say, and that is going to arguably engender an infinite causal regress. And given that the Patrick principle is a defeasible guide to what's possible, well, then we have some defeasible weight of a reason to think that infinite causal regresses are possible. Moreover, perfect being theism itself and divine power gives us some weight of a reason to think that infinite causal regresses are possible. In the perfect being theism literature, many proponents of perfect being theism are saying that perfect being theism considerations themselves can give us reason to think that some things are possible, that we otherwise wouldn't have any reason to think are possible. Consider, for instance, let's say some kind of aliens that can fly and that can talk, right? We might not have any particular reason to think that's possible, but given that we have a theistic God in the picture, 
you might think that, hey, we're in the business of giving God more power. The more power God is, the more grand he is, the more majestic and powerful and so on that he is, the better he is. And so that gives us some weight of a reason to ascribe as much power as we can in principle to God, even if we don't have otherwise independent reasons to think that something is possible. And so one might think that, yeah, of course God could create a creature like that, that flies and that can talk and that is rational. So like a flying rational animal of sorts. So even if we don't have independent reasons to think that that's possible, other than perfect being theistic considerations, those perfect being theistic considerations themselves can provide us some reason to think that the relevant thing is possible. And so given that all else being equal, God would be more powerful if he could actualize an infinite causal chain uh, than if he couldn't, well, then that gives perfect being theists some way of a reason to think that, hey, God can actualize that. We also have modal uniformity considerations. Josh Rasmussen, in one of his 2013 articles in the Australasian Journal of Philosophy entitled Uniformity as a Guide to Possibility, he develops a, a principle called modal uniformity. The principle is essentially that if X is possible and it differs merely in quantity or degree from Y, well, then we have defeasible reason to think that Y is possible. And I gave the vase example in the discussion that you just listened to earlier. And because we can specify infinite pasts that differ merely by quantity or degree from finite pasts, and because we know, or at least we think we know that finite pasts are possible, or at least by the proponents of causal finitism's lights, they think that we know that uh, the past is in fact finite, and hence the past is possibly finite, well then it follows that we have some weight of a reason per this modal uniformity principle to think that an infinite past is possible, because it differs in terms of quantity or degree merely from what we do know is possible, namely a finite past. We also have, moreover, an atheistic Morian argument, right? We could say that, hey, Kuhn's thinks causal finitism lends significant plausibility to, if not ultimately implies, in conjunction with other highly plausible things by Kuhn's lights, Kuhn thinks that causal finitism lends this kind of plausibility, if not implication, to theism. And so atheism would thereby lend significant plausibility to, if not ultimately implying, the negation of causal finitism, and hence the possibility of infinite causal chains. And so any reason favoring atheism is thereby a reason favoring the possibility of infinite causal regresses. And it's obviously false that there are no reasons whatsoever supporting atheism. And again, whether the reasons ultimately favor believing atheism is an altogether separate question from whether there are any reasons whatsoever that count in favor of atheism, however so slight those reasons might be. Now, why is all this relevant? Well, because according to Coons, if we had strong independent reason to believe that infinite regresses are possible, well, then we'd be forced to say that this Patrick principle fails in this particular case. Now let's go on to Coons's initial comments on what I said when I sketched the unsatisfiable paradiagnosis and so on. So he essentially gave an analogy with a proof of infinitely many prime numbers. And he was saying that, well, the unsatisfiable paradiagnosis doesn't really tell us which assumption it's more reasonable to reject, right? So consider, consider the case of Euclid's proof that there are infinitely many primes. So we can think of this proof as simply having two kind of working parts. One working part is what we can call Euclid's initial assumption. This is his assumption for reductio, but this is what we'll call his initial assumption, that there are only finitely many prime numbers. He's going to go on to reject this because he's going to use his bridge principle to tease out a contradiction from that. Again, this is one of the working parts. You have your initial assumption, Perhaps it's an assumption for reductio, but perhaps not. We have an assumption that there are only finitely many primes, and then we have Euclid's bridge principle. If there is an arbitrary finite collection of prime numbers, well, then it's possible to multiply them together and then add one to the resultant number. Now, it turns out, if you, for those of you math savants, if you do that, that's going to be a further prime number that wasn't originally in your collection, which was supposedly a collection of all of the finitely many prime numbers. And so you get a contradiction from this. There are more, there is another prime number that wasn't included in the finite list of all the prime numbers, or supposedly all the prime numbers. But again, we have a bridge principle here, and we have an initial assumption. Now, Euclid applies this bridge principle to the initial assumption to get a contradiction. What the contradiction tells us is that we have to reject one of these steps. We either have to reject that, no, it's false. There are only finitely many primes. Instead, there are infinitely many. Or we have to reject Euclid's bridge principle. Now, for Coons, by his lights, it's clear that we should prefer Euclid's bridge principle and simply reject that there are only finitely many primes. But then Kuhn's goes on to apply this to the case of causal finitism and the grim reaper paradox and the UPD. So here we, again, we have an initial assumption, which Kuhn's wants to take as an assumption for reductio, but we have an initial assumption here that there can be infinite causal regresses. And then we have Kuhn's bridge principle, which is his Patrick principle, essentially. And this Patrick principle or bridge principle says that if there can be infinite causal regresses and hence enough space and time in some framework world to fit infinitely many Grim Reapers, and if a Grim Reaper intrinsically specified is possible, well, then there's another possible world in which there are infinitely many duplicates of that Grim Reaper filling the infinitely many causal nodes from the framework world. 
Both of these two theses, these two elements together entail a contradiction. Now the contradiction only tells us that we have to reject one of these theses. We could reject the bridge principle or we could reject the initial assumption. If we reject the initial assumption, well then we say, no, there cannot be infinite causal regresses. Then we get causal finitism. Alternatively, if we reject this, well, then we either reject the Patrick principle or we nuance it. We modify it and say that it has some exception in this case, or we have a defeater in this case, or for some other reason, we have some kind of explanation for why it doesn't apply in this case. But like I said, you could also reject the Patrick principle altogether. Now, by Kuhn's lights, he thinks that it's clear, or at least it's clear to him, that we should reject not this Patrick principle, but instead we should reject this initial assumption. He says we should treat the Patrick principle as presumptively true in any given case. And moreover, so he says, we don't have any independent reasons to think that there can be infinite causal regresses. And so we should reject this one. If we did have an independent reason, well, then we could defeat that presumptive truth of this bridge principle, this Patrick principle. But again, as Kuhn's in my view, mistakenly says, there are no such independent reasons in favor of the possibility of infinite causal regresses. I've already attacked what he says there with respect to there being no independent reasons for that. I actually do think that there are independent reasons for that. But here are some further thoughts that I have. First, I explained above, well, I guess I already said this, I explained above that we do indeed have reason to think that there can be infinite causal regresses. Of course, we can debate their strength, and indeed I'm skeptical for at least some of the modal epistemological tools that I named, that they provide strong reasons in favor of the relevant metaphysical possibility claims. You can see, for instance, mitigated modal skepticism, which is a formidable, a formidable threat to a lot of these epistemological tools when applied to cases that are far beyond our ordinary experience. Though, well, I should note, if you reject the reasons that I gave on the basis of mitigated modal skepticism, you should also reject Kuhn's case here, because he He's applying a modal epistemological tool, namely the Patrick principle, in cases that are very far removed from our ordinary experience, like infinite duplications of these reaper mechanisms and so on. So anyway, that's kind of a double-edged sword. The crucial thing to see here is that there are still reasons. By contrast, there seems to be no clear reason in the case of Euclid's initial assumption. That is, no independent reason or collection of reasons uh, that, that independently justifies us in thinking that there could only be finitely many prime numbers or that there are only finitely many prime numbers. And indeed, we have positive reasons for that bridge principle, right? I can actually perform the multiplication and addition operations on the finite collection of prime numbers that the skeptic of Euclid's proof exclusively countenances. I can show the skeptic that I'm using the exact same procedure for other multiplications and additions that the skeptic grants are perfectly kosher. I can point to there being no relevant difference that could explain why the exact same procedure works for those cases, but not in Euclid's case, and so on. By contrast, Kuhn's uses what, what he calls an infinitary Patrick principle, and it's not clear what would support that infinitary Patrick principle. The reasons that he gave in the discussion that I had with him for the Patrick principle in general, or Patrick principles more generally, are that without them, it's unclear to Kuhn's how we could undergird our ordinary everyday modal knowledge, right? We rely on patching things together and rearranging and duplicating things in pretty ordinary humdrum ways to go around the world and so on. But of course, that doesn't apply to an infinitary Patrick principle where we are infinitely duplicating isolated possibilities into infinite, into infinite framework worlds. No one relies on that in their ordinary reasoning and so on. So it's not clear that we have strong or at least sufficiently strong independent reasons in favor of that infinitary Patrick principle. And moreover, we do have reasons in favor of that initial assumption, right? And so there does seem to be a relevant dissimilarity. In the case of Euclid, there seems to be no clear reason for that initial assumption. By contrast, there are reasons in favor of the initial assumption in Kuhn's, in this Kuhn's case. Moreover, uh, we seem to have positive reasons for the bridge principle in the Euclid case, whereas it's at least not clear to me that we have positive reasons in favor of the infinitary Patrick principle, at least as opposed to a finitary Patrick principle or something along those lines. So that's my first thought that I had. The second thought that I had was that there are known and pretty much universally agreed counterexamples or exceptions to Kuhn's bridge principle, that is cases where the principle simply fails, which is unlike Euclid's bridge principle. Everyone on all sides, even Kuhn's, as he said in my discussion with him, we all grant that there are exceptions or defeaters or whatever, or uh, counterexamples, however you want to put it. There are such things with respect to the Patrick principle. And that's unlike Euclid's bridge principle, right? We don't have universally agreed upon and like uncontroversial counterexamples there. And so there's another relevant dissimilarity between these cases. One task I'm interested in is finding a general explanation of the failures or at least general conditions under which they fail. This is something Lewis, I think, tried doing, right? He added certain provisos to his Patrick principle, such as size and shape permitting. One of my proposals here is simply to add another condition, right? In, in addition to size and shape permitting, we add size and shape and logical consistency permitting. This other condition is that the resultant or patched up or quilted world doesn't instantiate a logically inconsistent structure, that kind of structural explanation of why the quilted world cannot obtain. 
Thus, we would have size, shape, and logical consistency permitting, or I guess I could put structural logical consistency permitting. The theist, it seems, needs something like this too, for we can patch up worlds that are inconsistent with God's nature. And I'm going to go, I'm going to talk about these later on, so we can set that aside. And note, moreover, that the resultant proviso including principle still preserves our modal knowledge in precisely the way Coons wanted the proviso excluding version, right? When I rely on my ordinary humdrum experience of the world and rely on Patrick principles to duplicate or rearrange things. So, you know, I think that my laptop could be three feet over to the left. I think that uh, my water bottle could be, you know, in the other room over there. I think that that chair outside, I think that plausibly there could have been two of those chairs and so on that are, you know, intrinsic duplicates of one another. These are kind of ordinary humdrum applications of the Patrick principle. I'm not saying that I accept them here. I'm just giving an example and, you know, trying to show that when we apply the Patrick principle in these cases, we can easily use a proviso including Patrick principle, like the one that says size, shape, and lot structural logical consistency permitting, because we know that the resultant patched up quilted world, let's say where my laptop is three feet to the left, that doesn't contain any structural logical contradictions. And so this perfectly well undergirds precisely the modal knowledge that Coons sought to undergird with his principle. So that is my second response. And then my third response is that I can simply parody the response up here that Coons gave his, in his initial comments on the UPD. I can parody that with the Swan case as follows, right? So to make things concrete, suppose I want to take as my framework world, one in which the following holds true, A star, Swan got into a yellow taxi yesterday. Now suppose that I want to patch together a world in which A star is true, but also in which I populate the world with a spatiotemporal disjoint person, Jesus, and his various intrinsic bodily movements, namely saying to Swan with his mouth, lips, and vocal cord, and brain, and meaning, so on, the revelation that you've never gotten into a primary colored vehicle. That latter is individually possible, and we can suppose that the framework world, the world in which A star obtains, has enough room to accommodate this individual patch. So again, A star is individually possible, as is by Kuhn's lights, this individually possible case where Jesus reveals something to someone about whether or not they've gotten into a primary colored vehicle. And suppose that our framework world, the spatiotemporal world in which A star is true, has enough room in space-time to fit Jesus and the aforementioned intrinsic features and operations of him. Given the Patrick principle, I should be able to stitch together a world in which A star holds and in which the aforementioned Jesus to Swan revelation transpires. But of course, we've just arrived at a contradiction, right? For Jesus cannot reveal a falsehood to Swan. Traditional believers in Christianity and so on, they say, no, God can't deceive or lie or so on. And so this is an absurd situation. It involves Jesus deceiving or lying. But I just stitched together a world in which that happens. And the problem, of course, with this should be obvious, right? I can't patch Jesus and his intrinsic operations and features, which are individually possible, into a framework world that also has Swan doing something incompatible with Jesus's revelation. For that would be to patch into the world an entity which is incompatible with broader, more global facts about reality, namely the fact that Swan has gotten into a yellow taxi. Thus, although Jesus is individually possible, and although there's enough space and time in the framework world to accommodate him, the resultant patched up quilted world is not possible after all. The Patrick principle therefore disallows us to infer the possibility of such a world. And indeed, it also disallows us to infer the possibility of such a world, even conditional upon the lone possibility of A star, right? It would surely be absurd to suggest that A star is individually impossible or that framework world is individually impossible because we can use the Patrick principle to take us from the A star world to a world in which the conjunction of A star and the Jesus to Swan revelation transpires holds. And this is the exact same thing that's happening in the case of the paper passers, right? Sure, a paper passer who follows the relevant rules in individually possible, and sure, there's enough space and time in a world with a beginningless past to accommodate infinitely many such paper passers following the relevant rule, stretching back into a beginningless past, but the resultant patched up world is not possible for the same reason as the case of Jesus's revelation to Swan, right? That would be to patch into a world entities which are incompatible with broader, more global facts about reality, namely the fact that the past is beginningless. The Patrick principle therefore disallows us to infer the possibility of such a world, and indeed it also disallows us to infer the possibility of such a world, even conditional upon the lone possibility of a beginningless past. So now let's move on to a second point that Kuhn said when he was commenting on my presentation of the unsatisfiable paradiagnosis. Kuhn said that for some reason, it's just impossible, and he's intimating there that there is no explanation, there's no reason. Kuhn's saying, oh, for some reason, it's just impossible to put the two together, where the two are an infinite causal regress on the one hand, plus the duplications of the Grim Reapers to fit all the nodes of the infinite regress. By my lights, though, it's not as though it's just there's like no reason whatsoever. We do have an explanation and indeed perhaps multiple explanations. I'm gonna be talking with Alex Malpass in future videos about this branching actualism one because we are working on a paper on it. It's a really cool, fun paper uh, and applying that to the Grim Reaper paradox and the Kalam and so on and also contingency arguments. But we do have an explanation, right? As 
as Wes Morristan and I and Alex pointed out in the discussion that you just listened to, we have a logical structural constraint on which worlds can be. And similar to the Swan case, right? In the Swan case, we have a structure which is unsatisfiable given the natures of, of the things in question. We have two conditions, the one where Swan got into a primary colored vehicle yesterday or whatever, he got into a yellow taxi yesterday. And the second one is where a divine being reveals to Swan that he never got into a taxi yesterday, right? These two conditions are jointly unsatisfiable. And I can give you an explanation of that. I can give you a structural explanation of why, given the natures of these two things, they can't, they simply cannot co-obtain. But the same thing is holding true of the unsatisfiable paradiagnosis. I can run through the deduction if you want and show why, uh, given the natures of these two conditions, the beginninglessness condition and the property condition, we have a structural explanation of why they cannot co-obtain, why they cannot be co-instantiated. That is why it's impossible to put the two together. So now I just want to make some brief comments on the semantic future-oriented Benardetti paradoxes. So I just wanted to test this out with Rob, since this was at the edge of my thinking. I, I do think I, in retrospect, I should have focused on the knowledge-based future-oriented Benardetti paradox, since it doesn't take us into the weeds of the Tarski schema and whatnot. Uh, so if I could go back and redo it, I would simply go you know, straight to the knowledge-based one. My purpose in bringing up the semantic paradox that I did was to take an individual thought token for which Tarski's schema does hold and then patch infinitely many tokens of this kind of thought into the endless future. From that, we would get a contradiction. And that's simply true. Now, one way to block the contradiction, as Kuhn's rightly notes, is to point out that in the resultant patched up or quilted world, Tarski's schema cannot hold for each and every one of those thoughts. It must fail to hold of at least one of them. We can grant that adopting this thesis averts the contradiction, but this is crucially, though subtly, beside the point, right? The Patrick principle was supposed to allow us to duplicate that very thought into an endless future, right? Because the thought, along with its satisfaction of the T-schema, is individually possible, it simply follows from the Patrick principle that we can duplicate the thought and the thinkers into the endless future. And since they're all intrinsic duplicates of the original thought that satisfied the T-schema, the Tarski schema, they too will satisfy the T-schema or the Tarski schema. And so the Patrick principle does indeed mistakenly imply that the resultant world is a possible world. Now the T schema or Tarski schema, that just says that P if and only if P is true. So grass is green if and only if it is true that grass is green. Uh, that seems really, really plausible. Um, but you know, you get into trouble when you think about things like this sentence is not true. And so you get into the liar paradox. And some people have adopted uh, contextualist solutions to, those, to that paradox and related paradoxes, or ultimately you end up restricting or otherwise altering or revising the T schema to not make it apply to absolutely every single sentence that there is. Now, there are indeed two ways out of this semantic paradox, right? First, perhaps no such individual thought of the kind that I specified in my discussion with Rob, uh, where I was talking about uh, Sorensen's semantic Benedetti paradox, perhaps no such individual thought can satisfy the T schema, right? That's one way that you could avoid this. You could just say, no, none of those thoughts uh, just could in principle, satisfy the T schema. Uh, now, one question that we can ask at this juncture is why not? Again, I have to do more research on this. So, I mean, I just, I would wonder if someone who wants to take this response, why would it not satisfy the T schema in this case, right? We have benign cases. Again, I'm not sufficiently well-informed on the literature here to arbitrate on this. I'm just trying to give two ways out of the semantic, this, this particular semantic paradox. Uh, a second way out is although some such individual thoughts can satisfy the T schema, it's an extrinsic rather than intrinsic feature of a thought. I mean, maybe it just depends on whether there are infinitely many future token thoughts of a similar kind. Now, one worry that we might have for this response is that we might then open the door to the response that the relevant power or activation of power of the reaper is also extrinsic, right? It only has such a power or activates such a power provided that there aren't infinitely many reapers before it with the power slash activation of such a power. Its power or the activation thereof depends on the powers or activations thereof of other reapers. So that might be a potential worry that afflicts someone who wants to take this second way out. And also at this juncture, it's worth emphasizing, and I think this is a really interesting point that I want to think further on. In my discussion with Wes and Alex that you just listened to, arguably, Kuhn's Patrick principle, he can't, Kuhn's can't even use it in the case at hand because Kuhn's Patrick principle can only duplicate the intrinsic facts of something. It can only patch together a world that makes the patches and duplications that you're patching together. You're only going to be able to preserve the intrinsic facts of the individually specified possibility. But... Coons crucially relies on each of those reapers succeeding in their task. And arguably that success is going to have to be extrinsic. And so you're going to be able to block Coons' application of the Patrick principle to engender from the framework world of an infinite causal chain to 
uh, the purported possibility of a Benedetti paradox. So that's another thing to keep in mind at this juncture. Importantly, though, uh, so this is another thing that's super important that I want to say about the semantic future-oriented Benedetti paradox. It seems like we can still concoct Benedetti paradoxes that are both, one, non-causal, and so causal finitism would be utterly impotent to resolve them, in which case we would have to adopt something else like the UBD. So it seems like we can still concoct Benedetti paradoxes that are both, one, non-causal, and two, that don't rely on the T-schema, that uh, P, if and only if P is true. For we can simply bake into our setup that A, we have infinitely many sentences numbered with the natural numbers, the, which is the beginningless condition, and that B, each sentence is true if and only if no sentence with a larger natural number is true. That's the property condition. Now notice, so this fits the structure of the Benedetti paradox. And notice, moreover, that this doesn't seem to have anything to do with the T schema, right? There's no inference here from P to P is true or from P is true to P. Instead, we bake in truth from the get-go, right? The, the truth of each sentence is simply conditional on the truth of sentences with larger natural numbers than it. Uh, no one is saying, no one is going from grass is green to grass is green is true, right? No one is, no one is inferring like that. Okay, this paradox doesn't rely, so it seems to me, on the T schema, and yet it's a thoroughly non-causal paradox. And yet it has the exact same structure, literally an identical structure to the grimm reaper paradox. And what that tells us is that the solution to such a paradox cannot be causal finitism because we have essentially the exact same paradox in a non-causal form, which causal finitism would be impotent to resolve. It would be, it would be like someone saying that um, you could uh, get rid of Zeno's paradox of Achilles not being able to overtake the tortoise just by saying that tortoises are impossible. No, because you, you can run the exact same structural paradox just with like something like uh, maybe a, a turtle, right? Turtles are different from tortoises. So the kind of tortoise impossibleist, that is not the correct solution to this sort of paradox. And so similarly, if causal finitism is impotent to resolve structurally identical versions of the paradox, well, then it's not the right solution. But uh, I will say, though, that before developing this in published work, I will be studying the T-scheme in more detail, as well as Kuhn's work thereon, since I do recognize that I'm not absolutely certain that there is no implicit reliance on the T-scheme in the above specifications. It strongly seems to me that that's the case, but, you know, we have to have the requisite epistemic humility <laughs> at all times and to stress that and to remind ourselves of it. So anyway, now let's move on to the Patrick principle. So Kuhn says that we have to take the Patrick principle as presumptively true in any case, because otherwise there's no way for us to make any judgments about possibility. Now, that just strikes me as deeply implausible, right? There are tons of different modal epistemological tools other than the Patrick principle that we can use. We can use Josh's principle of modal uniformity. We can use conceivability. We can use imaginability and perceptual criteria, right? If something is imaginable, if we can flesh out a perceptual situation, or uh, if we have a dream in which, in which something perceptually appears to us to be the case, then we might have some defeasible reason for thinking that what perceptually appears is possible and so on. So we can use those sorts of criteria. We can use modal seemings or modal appearances. Chad McIntosh has a paper that was recently, actually that was published in the same issue as my first first article on existential inertia in the International Journal for Philosophy of Religion. He talks about modal seemings or modal appearances as justifying modal claims. You can talk about relevant differences between different situations, whether certain differences, let's say differences in quantity, are relevant to differences in the category of modal status. That's yet another modal epistemological tool that doesn't rely on the PP or so on. We know things about the natures or essences of things and their causal powers. And we can base our modal knowledge on our knowledge of essences and natures and causal power. Given my experience with salt and so on, and, and given my knowledge of its chemical composition and so on, I know that it has the disposition or causal power to dissolve when placed in water. And so I can know even if the salt that's, let's say on my kitchen table, I can know that even if that's never placed in water, I can know that it's possible for that thing to dissolve because I know its nature, I know the nature of water, I know its various causal powers and so on. I also know that various things in the world like me and other people have various causal powers by their nature too. They can pick up the salt and they can pour the salt into the water because I've seen them actually do that in the past. I've seen their exercises of causal power. So that's getting into the actual past exercises of causal power. So there are just lots of different ways to make modal judgments, to make judgments about possibility that don't rely on the Patrick principle. And so it's simply not true that without taking the PP as presumptively true, we would have no way for us to make any judgments about possibility. No, there are lots of different ways. Or, right, we could simply take a finitary or a finite Patrick principle rather than an infinitary Patrick principle. That's yet another way that we could go. That would block Kuhn's argument uh, and it would also help us undergird modal knowledge and so on. Or alternatively, we could have a Patrick principle with a logical contradiction proviso, as I was suggesting earlier, just as Lewis added his provisos of space and geometry permitting, because Lewis recognized that there are clear and obvious counterexamples uh, or cases where his Patrick principle doesn't apply. 
Oppie, for instance, in one of his published discussions with Rob Coons, uh, says he thinks that our judgments about what is really possible are grounded in our knowledge of the history of the actual world, the laws that govern what happens in the actual world, and the causal powers of the objects that belong to the actual world. This, too, doesn't seem to rely on taking the PP as presumptively true, and yet it allows us to make judgments about possibility, contrary to what Coons claims. So that's really my first thing. It just strikes me as deeply implausible, and I made a number of subpoints there. Uh, but second, suppose we both, one, grant the Patrick Principle, or grant PP, and two, grant that we should presume PP as true in any given case. Importantly, presumptions like these are defeasible, right? And plausibly, one way to defeat it in case C, some given case, is by showing that in case C, the massive ontological costs of PP's applicability to C far outweigh the cost of denying PP's applicability to C. And crucially, there is a good case to be made that this defeater holds for the case of causal finitism and Benedetti paradoxes. Causal finitism, as Alex Malpass and I have stressed in a variety of videos that we've made, has a huge concoction, a huge collection of massive ontological Costs. It's arguably going to be committing you to a full-blown spatiotemporal finitism, right? Uh, you're going to have to say that space is discrete rather than continuous, that time is discrete rather than continuous, or at least it's going to have to be non-continuous. You might take a kind of middle ground where there's an Aristotelian approach, but that's still a massive ontological commitment. You're denying continuous views of space and time, which many, many able philosophers have mounted both scientific and philosophical considerations in favor of continuous time and space and so on. You're arguably going to have to hold that space and time are finite in extent and so on. These are massive ontological costs. And just to give you a sense of why the causal finitus is arguably going to have to say that something like time is not continuous. Well, suppose that time is continuous. Well, then uh, if you just drop a ball down to the floor, well, then arguably you just had an infinite causal process, right? You can focus on the state of the system or the state of the ball its velocity, its momentum, its position, and so on, at each snapshot moment, at each snapshot time, at each, at each instant. And there are infinitely many of those instants. All of those states are causally impacting the, the nature and character of where it falls and how it falls and so on, and when it hits the ground. So we have infinitely many things in a causal sequence linked together. So you would have a violation of causal finitism if, if time is continuous. And so the causal finitism is going to have to say that time isn't continuous. And you can make similar arguments and similar points about space and time and so on. So yeah, like I said here for causal finitism, as Alex and I have emphasized elsewhere in other videos, again, check out my Kalam playlist, causal finitism has a massive ontological price tag, arguably committing its proponents to a full-blown spatiotemporal finitism. And so even if we granted PP and granted that we should presume it is true in any given case, arguably we, we do indeed have a defeater here because we have to weigh up the cost of simply denying PP's applicability to this case, a case far removed from ordinary experience and so on, versus the massive ontological costs accrued by applying PP in this case, and thereby adopting causal finitism. So those are my two responses to what Kuhn says here. And now let's get on to some causes for skepticism about the Patrick principle. So arguably, at least by my lights, it's pretty much universally recognized that there are counterexamples, or at least exceptions, or however you want to say it, defeaters for the Patrick principle. But I really think that there are a lot of counterexamples. What that should do for us, I think, is be a cause for serious concern as to whether or not this is a good guide to metaphysical possibility. And so and because these there are so many counterexamples and they come from so many different domains. And so I'm just going to look at, I think, seven here. So one of them is from gratuitous evils. Some of these counterexamples are reliant on the other, you know, someone granting theism or something along those lines. But that's fine in, in the dialectical context in, in which we're operating, right? Because Coons is a theist. So gratuitous evils is one of them. Secondly, uncaused coming into being. Thirdly, inductive skepticism. Fourthly, deterministic causation. Fifth, incarnation. Sixth, divine revelation. And finally, causal finitism itself. Okay, so consider gratuitous evil. So given the Patrick principle, there are no necessary connections among distinct things, or at least among the intrinsic characters of distinct things. To quote Rob Coons, quoting David Lewis in a PowerPoint presentation, here I rely on a Patrick principle for possibility. If it's possible that X happen intrinsically in a spatiotemporal region, and if it's likewise possible that Y happen in a region, well, then it's also possible that both X and Y happen in two distinct but adjacent regions. There are no necessary incompatibilities between distinct existences. Anything can follow anything. By the Patrick principle's own lights, there are no such necessary connections connections among the intrinsic characters of distinct things. But it seems to me that theism has to deny this, precisely because there is a necessary connection between the intrinsic character of God, namely the fact that he's essentially morally perfect and hence must have a good reason for the evil he permits, and the obtaining of some evil state of affairs. This, in turn, means that every evil state of affairs is essentially connected to some outweighing good state of affairs. But then the Patrick principle is simply false, for then there are necessary connections among the intrinsic characters of distinct existences. 
that is distinct things or what goes on in distinct space-time regions. Thus, contra the Patrick principle, there are necessary connections among the intrinsic characters of distinct and spatio-temporally disjoint things, such as evil states of affairs and their corresponding outweighing good states of affairs. And basically, you know, just imagine that we take a horrendously evil state of affairs that is individually possible, and per the Patrick principle, right, we patch together a world containing nothing but these horrendous evils without any outweighing goods that accrue therefrom in the resultant patched up world. The possibility of such a horrendous torture world would follow from the Patrick principle, which allows us, of course, to take individual possibilities and their intrinsic characters and then populate worlds in whatever manner we please, so long as there is enough time and space to fit what we patch in. This is part and parcel, of course, of the Patrick Principle's denial of necessary connections among the intrinsic characters of distinct things, or at least intrinsic characters of distinct things in distinct spatiotemporal regions, non-overlapping spatiotemporal regions. So again, the theist is going to have to say, okay, uh, the Patrick Principle has an exception here, or there is a counterexample to the Patrick Principle, or maybe it's a defeater, however, whatever language we want to use. We can say exception, we could say counterexample if we want to have a fully generalized Patrick Principle, or we could say that it's a defeater for a defeasible principle, whatever. So that's the first one. Here's the second one, right? Consider patching a coming into being without a cause, and yet arguably that is absurd, right? We don't take an isolated case where something comes into being without a cause and then patch that into a world. Rather, what we're doing is we consider an isolated spatial temporal region, which is intrinsically such that something comes into being in that region. That happens all the time. And so it's possible individually. And then we take as a framework world, a kind of like an empty universe, say, which has enough room to accommodate this intrinsic possibility of something coming to being. And then we just patch that in. And that's all that we patch into that world. Maybe in the rest of the world, we just patch in you know, empty noise or whatever, whatever we want. Crucially, though, we can secure that we don't patch anything into that world that could serve as a cause of that thing in question. And so by means of the Patrick principle, we can get to a world in which that coming into being happens without a cause. And since that's absurd, it follows that the Patrick principle is false, or at least we have another exception on our hands, another defeater on our hands, another counterexample on our hands, whichever language you prefer. Or consider humanism and inductive skepticism as counterexamples. To me, the Patrick principle seems to be born out of a deeply human view of nature on which there are no necessary connections among the intrinsic characters of distinct existences, right? That's what gets Hume into so much trouble concerning induction and other sorts of things, right? According to Hume, anything can follow anything. And that's going to engender serious problems of induction under Hume's view, right? A billiard ball upon, upon impact from another billiard ball, uh, because it's in a distinct but adjacent spatiotemporal region, and because we can intrinsically specify it in countless different ways, well, given the Patrick principle, there are going to be boatloads of worlds in which the billiard ball hits the second billiard ball, but yet the second billiard ball might explode or it disappears or it just flies upwards towards the ceiling or whatever, right? Induction is simply gutted. For any inductive world, which is uniform, we're going to have countless different worlds that we can patch and stitch together where we just patch them in super counterinductive ways, uh, even though we're, you know, we're preserving enough space and time and individual possibilities and duplicating those in such and such a way that we get a counterinductive world. And so the idea here is that firstly, induction is reliable, but yet too, if the Patrick principle is true, well, then there are boatloads of nearby counterinductive worlds. So worlds in which induction fails from like, let's say today forward. And in that case, induction would be unreliable, right? If boatloads of nearby, nearby worlds are counterinductive or such that induction fails, well, then induction would simply be unreliable. But yet induction is reliable, and so the Patrick principle is false. Or at least we have another exemption or another exception or another defeater to the Patrick principle on our hands here. Or consider deterministic causation, right? Plausibly, there are cases of causation where the intrinsic character of one thing, C, causally determines the intrinsic character of another thing, E. In that case, it cannot be the case that C obtains without E, contra the Patrick principle. And we can even supp suppose that C and E, we can specify them intrinsically and suppose that they're in distinct, adjacent, non-overlapping, disjoint spatiotemporal regions. But this is gonna be a counterexample to the to Patrick principle because you can't have E without C. You can't patch one thing without also patching the other thing together because there's a deterministic causal link between them, which is a necessitating link. In fact, many think, not implausibly, that this is true of most cases of causation, except for some contentious interpretations of quantum phenomena and contentious libertarianism about human freedom. So we have yet another counterexample on our hands. Consider yet another counterexample, which is the incarnation, right? God is omnipotent, and so he could become incarnate if he wanted to. And so let's suppose that God becomes incarnate, Suppose that this is done in or through Jesus, and now Jesus has various intrinsic mental states, right? He can just say something to himself in his mind, his beliefs or desires or emotions and so on. And since he's God, he can't be mistaken. And now the following 
are each individually possible, where B is a basket located in space-time region R, which is distinct from but adjacent to the space-time region R star occupied by Jesus. So first, Jesus believes that there are three loaves of bread in R, or we can just, we don't even have to talk about beliefs because some people might think those are extrinsic. Just say, Jesus is just like, you know, how we each have like that little voice inside of our heads, right? That's clearly intrinsic to someone. I suppose that Jesus uses that mental voice, that sort of thing, just to say to himself, there are three loaves of bread in B, or like, yeah, I think that there are three loaves of bread in B. So he says that to himself and he moreover takes various intrinsic attitudes towards it. So he like affirms it. He, he says, yeah, 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 that's right. Or, you know, something along those lines. These are intrinsic facts of Jesus. So there's some sense in which he's believing here that there are three loaves of bread and B or in, in some other way, committing himself to that. This is an intrinsic fact about Jesus's mental state and hence a fact intrinsic to space on region R. And secondly, here's a second individual possibility. There aren't three loaves of bread in basket B, right? It's obvious that, you know, there might not have been three loaves in that particular basket at that particular region. That's a possibility. There's a possible world in which individually there aren't three loaves of bread in that basket. And moreover, there's a further other possible world in which this there's this individual possibility of Jesus having these intrinsic mental facts. Now, if the Patrick principle were true, it would simply follow that there is some third possible world, W, in which both of these one and two obtain because they're intrinsically specified. And given the Patrick principle, we could just take one and stitch it into stitch it into a framework world and take the other and stitch that into the framework world. Bada bing, bada boom, we'd have, for the Patrick principle, a possible world in which both one and two obtain. But in that world, of course, Jesus is mistaken. Uh, but he can't be mistaken because he's God and, you know, God can't be mistaken. Uh, and so we get a contradiction. And so the Patrick principle, we have yet, yet another counterexample or yet another exception or so on. Hopefully you're starting to see why this is arguably not that reliable a guide to metaphysical possibility. Moreover, we have further counterexamples from divine revelation cases. So theists will surely grant that God can reveal things to finite creatures, such that the finite creatures' beliefs are intrinsic to them. And it seems plausible, moreover, that there could be, not that there must be, but that there could be some distinctive intrinsic phenomenological character essentially associated with this true and veridical revelation that gives the creature utter assurance that the revelation is from God, and that this distinctive intrinsic phenomenological character is only grantable by God through the revelation a gift of certitude in revealed truth, we might call it. And from this, we can get another counterexample to the Patrick principle because this creature has certain intrinsic states, which are firstly, essentially tied to their origin in God. And, se and secondly, are intrinsically such that there it's an, like an intrinsic belief state about what happens, let's say, in another spatio-temporal region, intrinsically in that region. But then, given the Patrick principle, we can patch this creature and its intrinsic phenomenological character, which is essentially originated from God. We can patch together a world in which that creature obtains and all the intrinsic facts about that creature obtains. But that other space-time region that the creature's belief specifies something about, where that other space-time region is characterized totally differently, which renders the, the creature's belief false. And in that case, the creature, we can conclude in this world that God actually deceived the creature or was mistaken or revealed somehow a falsehood to the creature, which is not possible. So we get yet another counterexample, arguably, or another exception, whatever to the Patrick principle. And similarly with the Swan case, we don't need to go over, but we already went over that earlier. Or consider causal finitism itself, right? Causal finitism itself is arguably gonna be providing exceptions to the Patrick principle. So long as space is possibly infinite in extent or time is possibly continuous or space is possibly continuous, we'll be able to take the space-time structure of such worlds and duplicate the intrinsic powers of other possible things and situate them in a causal network such that we deliver an infinite causal chain. We would just need simultaneous causation in the case of the spatial versions. To deny this result, you'll have to maintain that one, space is necessarily finite in extent, two, time is necessarily discrete or at least non-continuous, and three, space is necessarily discrete or at least non-continuous. But first, this is a gargantuan cost in terms of its ontological price tag and the mountains of literature on the topology of space-time and the panoply of arguments for continuous use. And second, surely if you can legitimately avoid the issues Patrick Principles pose for causal finitism in this manner, the non-causal finitist can equally legitimately avoid the issues Patrick Principles pose for non-causal finitism in a way that simply stipulates that any situation satisfying the beginninglessness condition necessarily fails also to satisfy in addition the property condition. So I've just been going over a bunch of different exceptions or as the case may be, defeaters or counterexamples to the Patrick principle, or at least a collection of Patrick principles. Coons recognizes that there are such exceptions and he grants it. What does he say though, in response to these points? And how does it bear on causal finitism and the UPD and Benedetti paradoxes? Well, that's what we're gonna to get to next. So according to Coons, whenever there are exceptions to the Patrick principle, there is some causal explanation for why there is that exception. This is something he said in my discussion with him. Now, I have two responses to this. First, my question, and I know Malpass and Morrison and I, we talked about this in, uh, in the discussion that you just listened to, or hopefully you listened to. Why, right? 
Why can't there be a non-causal explanation for why there is that exception? Perhaps there's a grounding explanation or a functional realization explanation or lots of other explanations for why there may be exceptions. Perhaps one thing's intrinsic character activity grounds the intrinsic character activity of another thing in an adjacent but disjoint spatiotemporal region. Since grounding is a necessitating relation, we would have here yet another exception to the Patrick principle. And importantly, an exception for which there is a non-causal explanation. When I was pressing Coons on this in the discussion that I had with him, he just simply kept reasserting that there is some causal explanation. Now, again, I'm not claiming that Coons doesn't have any reason whatsoever for thinking that uh, there must be some causal explanation, but he certainly didn't give a reason in the discussion that I had with him. Fundamentally, Coons doesn't answer the following question. Why does there have to be a causal explanation of why there is an exception instead of a mere explanation, whether or not it's a causal explanation? Again, as, as an aside, when I press Coons on this non-causal explanation point in the video, he just repeats rather than justifies that the explanation must be causal. Notice, moreover, that once we accept that there merely has to be an explanation, whether causal or not, the UPDS can rest content with a non-causal structural explanation of why there are exceptions to the Patrick principle in the case of Benedetti constructions. This is something that Malpass Morrison and I were emphasizing in our discussion just then. The structural explanation comes in terms of the abstract structure that the concrete specifications of the paradox instantiate. And I can take you through a logical derivation that, at least by my lights, illuminates or explains why there can be no such instantiation. So that is my first response to what Kuhn says there. My second response is that I think the claim is just false. Recall my panoply of counterexamples or exceptions to the Patrick principle from earlier. Very few of them are such that there are causal explanations for why they represent exceptions to the Patrick principle. And so let's take a stroll through them. So first, gratuitous evils. The explanation for why the resultant world is impossible and why we can't patch evils together in such a way is that it is simply in the nature of a perfect being that it couldn't actualize or permit a world containing nothing but horrendous gratuitous evils with no goods accrued therefrom. This is an explanation in terms of essential constraint, right? It doesn't seem by my lights to be a causal explanation. I mean, sure, God has to cause which creation comes about, and he's the cause of creation's character. And so he is the cause in each world of there being no such sequence of horrendous gratuitous evils. But the obvious question to ask is, why is God only causing such creations in which there is no such sequence of horrendous gratuitous evils? And the obvious answer is in terms of God's character, right? His essential perfection, his love, his goodness, or whatever. He acts in accordance with those. These offer constraints on the range of creations that, that it's even within God's power to actualize in the first place. These essential constraints are explanatorily prior to any of God's causal acts, for they delimit which causal acts God can perform to begin with. The ultimate explanation for the exceptions to the Patrick principle deriving from gratuitous evils, then, is non-causal. Notice that if the theist protests that the explanation here is still partly causal, well, then the UPDS can say the same thing with the explanation of PP's exception in Benedetti's constructions, right? For the UPDS can then say that part of the explanation of why Benedetti constructions are impossible is that the collection of factors that causally brings about the infinite collection of reaper type mechanisms causally produces them in each possible world in an arrangement that fails to instantiate both the beginningless and property conditions. And so we have a partly causal explanation of why no world includes reaper type mechanisms instantiating a Benedetti paradox. But of course, as with the theistic case, the further explanation of why the collection of causal factors here doesn't causally produce a Benedetti arrangement of reaper type mechanisms, that's gonna be non-causal. It's in terms of a logical structural constraint. Now, it is strange, at least to me, that Coons says, paraphrasing, that God exists necessarily and God has certain attributes necessarily, and th that causally constrains the space of possibilities and emphasis here on causally constrains the space of possibilities. Now, at least by my lights, this is strange because I don't see how this could be a causal explanation. What's the cause here? Like, what's the effect? I mean, is the cause God's character while the effect is the character of the space of possible worlds? I just struggle to see how the former causally brings about or produces the latter. I mean, firstly, you would think that causes and effects, because they're standing in relations to one another, they would have to exist, right? Non-existent things don't stand in relations. So then you'd have to be committed, ontologically committed to something, some X, which is the character of the space of possible worlds. Like What? Like that seems very ontologically profligate as it were. But uh, anyway, setting that issue aside, I just struggle to see how the former causally produces or brings about the latter. Moreover, right? God is identical to God's character under Kuhn's divine simplicity. And so God is causing the character of the space of possible worlds here. But for God to cause something is for God to bring it about or produce it. And for God to bring about something or produce it is for God to create it. And God is free under Kuhn's classical theism to create or refrain from creating anything, right? That's just a commitment of classical theism. And so God is free to refrain from causing the character of the space of possible worlds. 
But then the character of the space of possible worlds is contingent, right? He God could have refrained from causing that character. And so it could have failed to be. And that is surely absurd, right? The character of the space of poss all possible worlds, that is utterly invariant, right? That's about what's possible and what's necessary. Those facts don't change. It's not as though in one world, it's necessary that two plus two equals four and in another world, it's not necessary or contingent. And moreover, it's not as though in one world, it's possible that humans exist, but somehow in another possible world, humans are impossible. Like that, that's really weird. And that would straightforwardly also violate system S5 since that would entail that some possibilities aren't necessarily possible uh, for it entails that the character of the space of possible worlds could have been different. Additionally, so here's yet another response. If this is an instance of causation, if somehow God's character is somehow causing the character of the space of possible worlds, like constraining it in some way or exerting some kind of mysterious force on it, as it were, if that is an instance of causation, well, then I don't see why the UPDist can't make a symmetrical move, right? <laughs> they could say, hey, logical space is necessary, and it has certain attributes necessarily, uh, and that causally constrains the space of metaphysical possibilities. Now, again, you might find that to be like, oh, how is that causation? But then like, I'm going to say the same thing is applying to the case of God somehow constraining the space of possible worlds. My third response is that I seem just as warranted as Kuhn's in asserting that the constraint here is a non-causal grounding constraint, right? It just seems that God's character would be grounding the character of the space of possible worlds. And that would make much more sense than causation because grounding is uh, a necessitating relation, whereas God's causing something that's like God creating it, right? And God is free to refrain from creating. And so it's contingent that God causes anything, say. So anyway, it seems more plausible to me, firstly, that we have a non-causal grounding explanation here. But the point that I want to highlight is that I seem to be just as warranted, if not more warranted, but set that aside, I seem just as warranted as Coons in asserting that the explanation here, not the constraint, but the explanation here is a non-causal grounding one. But then first, Coons' claim that every exception is causally explained is unwarranted, since we're equally warranted in claiming instead merely that every exception is either causally or non-causally explained. And second, the UPDS can then say that the character of the space of metaphysically possible worlds is partly grounded in facts about logic and structural inconsistencies. And so we equally have a grounding type explanation of PP's exception in Benedetti constructions. Again, what we're doing here, just remember, we're examining Coons' claim. His claim was that whenever there are exceptions to the PP, there is some causal explanation for why there is that exception. I'm making two general responses. My first one is like, well, <laughs> why? I mean, and it just seems implausible. Anyway, that was my first response. But my second response is that that's just false. And what we're doing now is we're going through each of the counterexamples or exceptions or defeaters to the Patrick principle. And I'm arguing that most, if not all of them, are actually non ultimately non-causal explanations of the failure of the Patrick principle. We just went through gratuitous evils. We also, or now we're going to be going through uncaused coming into being. We're going to systematically proceed through each of these counterexamples to the PP. Now, the explanation for why we can't patch into framework world W an isolated intrinsically specified possibility of some X coming into being in spatiotemporal region R without patching into W anything in any other spatiotemporal region that could serve as X's cause that's also non-causal. The explanation for this whole explanandum is non-causal, right? The explanation is simply that comings into being necessarily require causes. Uh, I think that's plausible, but also just assume that we're granting this to the Kalam proponent in the dialectical context at hand. The explanation is the metaphysical principle that whatever begins to exist has a cause, right? It doesn't seem to me that anything causes this metaphysical principle's truth. Um, that just seems clear to me. Like, is there something that's like causally bringing about, causally making it be the case? that whatever begins to exist has a cause? I mean, yes, whatever begins to exist, that's having a causal explanation, but we're talking about the principle, right? The truth of the principle here, that doesn't seem to have a causal explanation. And moreover, suppose that like God causes the principle's truth. I mean, that would be the only, and that seems to be the only candidate, at least under the theistic worldview, because God's a necessary being and this principle would be necessarily true if true at all. But for God to causally produce something is, again, for God to create it. But under Kuhn's classical theism, God could have refrained from creating anything. And moreover, there being anything apart from God requires that God created it. And from these, it follows that the principle could have failed to be true. But then it isn't a necessary truth, which is absurd. And it's contrary to our hypothesis. We were assuming that it is, in fact, a necessary truth. So again, we seem to have a non-causal explanation here of why we have an exception to the Patrick principle, of why the Patrick principle fails in the case of patching together uncaused comings into being. As for inductive skepticism, the explanation for the failure of the counterinductive patchings together, I think that depends on what one thinks explains the reliability of induction. And that just gets us into way too many weeds. So I'm not going to claim that this one has a non-causal explanation. I'm also not going to claim that it has a causal explanation. It just depends on what one thinks explains the reliability of induction. As for deterministic causation, uh, where C is the deterministic cause of E, the explanation for why we can't patch together a world in which C obtains without E is that C deterministically causes E. 
Well, what explains why C deterministically causes E? Well, the best answer by my lights is that there's just something in C's very nature that accounts for why it necessarily brings about or produces E. And that is plausibly a non-causal explanation. What about the incarnation? Well, the explanation for why we can't patch together the relevant world here is that Jesus, as God, cannot be mistaken, right? But notice again that this isn't a causal explanation of the exception to the Patrick principle here. Instead, we're citing an essential feature of Jesus that constrains the range of actions that he can perform, and forming mistaken beliefs is simply not among them. That's not even among his causal powers. It's not as though he's like exerting some causal power to prevent himself from lying. Rather, it just flows from his essential nature or character that he cannot lie. It's not even within the range of his causal acts. And this is, a, this is delimiting the very range of possible acts that he can perform to begin with. And so it's not as though he's performing some causal act whereby or by which he's preventing himself from forming mistaken beliefs and so on. Or so it seems to me. And so we don't seem to have a causal explanation here. I'm obviously open to being corrected. I mean, all I want is the truth here, right? I'm trying to get at the truth. Uh, and so if I'm mistaken, that would be something to rejoice in, right? Because we would be, I'd be discovering more treasures of truth. What about the divine revelation case? Well, again, the explanation for why the Patrick principle has an exception here is that God cannot reveal falsehoods to people. And this in turn seems non-causally explained by God's essential perfection. Now, actually, uh, if we had a causal explanation here, well, then it would seem as though God's perfection would be causally affecting something else about God, namely his inability to deceive or lie or reveal falsehood. Uh, and that's impossible under classical theism, uh, according to which God cannot be causally affected in any way. Uh, that's the doctrine of divine impassibility that Kuhns himself affirms. So yet again, we have a non-causal explanation here of the exception for the Patrick principle. What about causal finitism itself? Well, the explanation for why we can't patch together a world containing infinitely many causes impinging on one target state is the truth of causal finitism, right? But we haven't cited here a causal explanation. We've cited a metaphysical constraint on worlds, namely the metaphysically necessary truth of causal finitism, right? It's not as though the truth of causal finitism, it's like sticking its tentacles in the world and causally preventing infinite causal chains from arising. Uh, and moreover, it's not as though something is like, sticking his tentacles in the world and causing causal finitism to be true. That's like somehow, oh, it's like, oh crap, if I don't do something, uh, infinite causal cha chains are gonna arise. No, they're, they're just metaphysically impossible. So again, we have a non-causal explanation arguably of the failure of the Patrick principle or why we have an exception to the Patrick principle in the cases of causal finitism. Kuhn's also said in the discussion that I had with him that deriving the contradiction in the quilted world with respect to the Benedetti constructions, that's only gonna tell us that the conjunction of the problematic hypothesis namely the framework world in which we have an infinite causal regress. The conjunction of that with the Patrick principle is impossible. According to Kuhn's, we have no explanation here as to why there would be an exception to the Patrick principle. He says that we have no reason whatsoever why there is an exception here. But to me, I can say the exact same thing about the theistic hypothesis. Right? I can say, oh no, the fact that we get a contradiction in the resultant quilted world, namely a contradiction between God's perfection and the horrendous character of the world, uh, namely there being absolutely no good that accrues from gratuitous evils, all that tells us is that the conjunction of theism with the problematic hypothesis that it's individually possible that there is a really bad evil and we have a framework universe that can fit a lot of really bad evils, all that says is that the conjunction of all that with the Patrick principle is impossible. Uh, we have no explanation here as to why there would be an exception to the Patrick principle. Rather, we just have a, a conjunction of various hypotheses, which are which jointly entail a contradiction. You haven't given me an explanation as to why there'd be an exception to the Patrick principle. Again, I can say the same thing for Kuhn's in these various cases that he himself wants to use. He wants to say that theism provides some kind of explanation here. But then I can just retort the exact same thing that he's saying, like just focusing on, no, that only shows that the conjunction of the Patrick principle when applied to theism gives us a contradiction. And then he said, you need an independent reason favoring the initial hypothesis. So let's say perhaps in the case of the ones that I was just considering theism, uh, because we of course know that there are framework worlds that can fit a lot of horrendous evil. And we also know that some pretty horrendous evils are individually possible. So the relevant hypothesis here is gonna have to be theism. So what he says is that you need an independent reason favoring the initial hypothesis in order to carve out an exception. To, to the Patrick principle in the case at hand. Now, first I'm gonna say that, well, we actually have those in the case of the possibility of infinite causal regresses. I gave those at the very beginning, but also secondly, this arguably makes the argument question begging. We're in a context in which the truth of, of causal finitism and theism are the very questions at issue, right? This is something, again, I'm not gonna go into this in depth because Malpass, Morrison, and I talked about that. All right, so now we are on to the final section of the video, which is on future-oriented Benedetti paradoxes. Uh, Kuhn says that if God has foreknowledge, well, then it's because his internal states are causally posterior to something that's in the future. Now, that strikes me as implausible because that itself would seem to violate causal finitism with an endless future, right? So long as you have an endless future, you have infinitely many days that, are, that will happen in the future, 
And so you've infinitely many dis distinct things and God knows those things. And so God's internal states will be causally posterior to infinitely many things, let's say that happen on the infinitely many days of the future. And so you would have infinitely many things causally impacting or impinging on one target state, which would violate causal phantasm. What that would show us is that either God can't have a knowledge of what happens in the future, uh, or else the future is necessarily finite so that you don't have those infinitely many things that could causally impinge on God's internal state. And also this is strange because uh, Kuhn's accepts divine impassibility, and yet this would violate divine impassibility because God would be causally affected by something. Now, um, we'll return to this later since Kuhn's, I, I say contradicts himself, but you know, I want to be maximally charitable. So I think it's more charitable to say that he comes to clarify that his actual position, or he comes to clarify his actual position, and that he wasn't actually stating his actual position when he made this quoted remark above. So yeah. So Kuhn's then went on to say that, well, God cannot create the situation I described, the future oriented Benedetti paradox, precisely because it would violate causal finitism. But the problem with saying this is that the Patrick principle simply entails that it would be possible, right? I took a framework world with an endless future, which Kuhn's grants as possible. I then took an individually possible patch, namely an angel that implements the relevant rule, write my number on the paper, if and only if no la later angel writes their number. Or I could say, if and only if the angel tomorrow doesn't write its number. I'm actually gonna put that here, the angel tomorrow doesn't write its number. I then duplicated this patch into the framework world. By the Patrick principle, it simply follows that the resultant patched up quilted world must be possible. And yet it isn't since it instantiates the unsatisfiable pair. And so since Kuhn's grants that an individual angel of the kind I specified is possible, it simply follows that either there cannot be a framework world with an endless future or else the Patrick principle is false. Now, one thing again that he might do here is to defeasibilize the Patrick principle, that is to make it defeasible, and then say we have an exception in this case. And that exception is the truth of causal finitism itself. But then he's, firstly, he's succumbing to the exact same point missing. He accused the unsatisfiable paradiagnosis of. The point is that if we have a framework world with an endless future, then given the Patrick principle, we could construct a possible violation of causal finitism by means of the Patrick principle, right? Since that's not possible by Kuhn's own lights, it would follow that the framework world isn't possible after all, and hence the future cannot be infinite, right? Moreover, I can equally well say that there cannot be a situation of the kind Kuhn's described because it would violate the law of non-contradiction. So we have an exception in this case, and the defeater is the law of non-contradiction. Now, another problem with this response is just to remember the dialectical context, right? The truth of causal finitism is the very question at issue in this dialectical context. And so it doesn't count as an independent reason to defeat the Patrick principle in this case. We are trying in this context to find out whether causal finitism is true. And so it doesn't count as something antecedently independently motivated and so liable to defeat application of the Patrick principle on this occasion. To put things differently, right? We can, and this is how I was putting at the end of my discussion with Malpass and Morstan. I can use the Patrick principle in the future-oriented angelic paradox, and I don't even have to give a paradoxical situation of it, I can use a Patrick principle and I can even construct a perfectly benign infinite causal chain where future events causally impact by Kuhn's lights, some present state. I can use the Patrick principle in such future-oriented cases to deliver the falsity of causal finitism. Kuhn's can use the principle, the Patrick principle, to deliver by his lights the truth of causal finitism. And now the question is, why should we prefer Kuhn's application of the Patrick principle over my application? Appealing to causal finitism itself clearly won't do here, right? Kuhn's can say, oh, well, your application of the Patrick principle doesn't work there because causal finitism is true. <laughs> I can equally well return and say, no, your, your application Kuhn's doesn't, the Patrick principle doesn't work here because causal finitism is false. How do I know that? Well, because I use the Patrick principle in this context to deliver the falsity of it. And again, how does Kuhn's know that causal finitism is true? Well, because he used the Patrick principle to deliver it to him. And so we have a kind of symmetry here. And it seems to me that there's no non-question begging way to stomp one's foot and prefer one of these applications of the Patrick principle over the other. Kuhn's also says that it's possible for God to make earlier events causally dependent on later events. And that's what God does when prophecy happens. But what he can't do is produce a situation where an infinite cascade of future events is going to affect some past event. But here's something important to notice, right? I can construct my future-oriented Benedetti paradox in a way that doesn't require as an isolated individual possibility that God prophesied to an angel today based on what will or will not happen on each day of an endless future. Instead, I can simply specify that the isolated individual possibility consists in God prophesying to an angel today based solely on what will or will not happen tomorrow. And then given Kuhn's infinitary Patrick principle and a framework world containing an endless future, I can duplicate such a scenario ad infinitum into the future. It is only as a result of the application of the Patrick principle to the individual slash isolated possibility that we get a violation of causal finitism here, since the infinite duplication will result in, an, in the angel's choice today being dependent on infinitely many future angelic choices. And so Kuhn's Patrick principle would entail either that causal finitism is false or that the future cannot be endless. And notice here 
that causal finitism cannot serve as an independent reason to restrict the Patrick principle here, since causal finitism is precisely the point of contention in this dialectical context. And also, if people don't like God looking into the creative future and basing his present decisions on his foreknowledge thereof, we can actually entirely circumvent this. Just take the following stone monument case. So we can suppose as an individual possibility that God can create a stone monument engraved on which is a revealed message and an intrinsic character that is uniquely and essentially divine originated. Uh, the revealed message says, I shall intend to create an angel today, if and only if I do not intend to create an angel tomorrow. Now note that this only requires that God know his own intentions about what he's going to do the following day, right? It doesn't require him to know anything about creation and to base his current acts on what he knows will happen in creation. Instead, he's simply consulting his own intentions. It doesn't require him to know anything about what will happen in creation and then to base his current acts on what he knows will happen in creation. Instead, he's simply consulting his own intentions, right? And now we can use Kuhn's infinitary Patrick principle to duplicate this intrinsically specified stone monument into an endless future, and then contradiction would ensue. Finally, I want to talk about Proust and quote-unquote nearby non-contradictory almost Benedetti setups. So uh, I mentioned Proust at one point in my discussion with Rob Coons, and I didn't really have the time in the live discussion to respond to it. Proust basically claims that plausibly, if the benign Grim Reaper story is possible, then, well, then the paradox paradoxical story is possible too. Now, the benign story is basically like, again, we have those infinitely many Reapers that are converging from the later than direction to noon, right? So they're converging from one to noon, we got one at one o'clock, we got one at 12.30, we got one at 12.15, one at 12.07, you know, 12.07.5 or whatever, and so on ad infinitum. So that, that would be paradoxical if we just specified that with all those reapers performing their task infallibly. But what we do is we just suppose that there's a reaper that's like an hour earlier, right? And again, that's going to be benign. That's not going to be contradictory because that first reaper will just wake up and kill Fred. And then all the other ones are just going to wake up and be like, oh, yay, Fred is dead. We don't have to do anything. And then they just go back to sleep. That is a benign story. There's no contradiction there. But that is, in some sense, super duper close to a world in which the paradoxical story comes about, right? All you need to do is change that one reaper's activation time, right? That's the only difference, as it were. Well, that's not the only difference because, of course, there's the difference is whether or not the beginningless condition is satisfied, but that's one of the only minor differences between the worlds. What Proust wants to claim is that plausibly, if the benign story is possible, then the paradoxical story is possible too. And adds that plausibly, if causal finitism is false, well, then the benign story is indeed possible, right? Because that would instantiate an infinite causal chain and there's nothing contradictory about it. So it would seem to be possible under causal, fin under causal finitism's falsehood. These two together, because the paradoxical story isn't, after all, possible, you'd be able to get that causal finitism is true from these two premises. Now, the first thing to note in response is that the unsatisfiable paradiagnosis is not committed to premise two. Uh, the unsatisfiable paradiagnosis can deny it if they wish. It's not a trivial claim. It's a metaphysical claim about possibilities that are far removed from our ordinary experience. Uh, we need to be given good reasons to think that it's true, and I don't think Proust or Coons or anyone for that matter has done that at least as of yet. Uh, but set that aside. For I think that one is deeply implausible. And I think that its implausibility is shown if we consider other cases where we have A, a contradictory setup, S, and B, a quote-unquote nearby non-contradictory almost S setup. Consider a quote-unquote nearby non-paradoxical story, again, involving Swan getting into a yellow taxi the day after God tells him that he's never gotten into a primary colored vehicle. Well, in that case, the only difference between the original and new story is in the timing of when Swan gets into a primary colored vehicle, right? Just as the only difference or quote unquote only difference between the benign Reaper scenario and the paradoxical one is in the timing of the Reapers' activations. Imagine now that I reason as follows. Well, hey, if the benign Swan story is possible, well, then surely the paradoxical one is possible too. Well, okay, that just strikes me as absurd. And it's the same sort of thing that Proust is doing here above. And note that we can similarly add as an analog to the second premise too above uh, that the possibility of swans getting into a yellow taxi plus the Christian God in the picture uh, implies the possibility of the benign swan story. And this would allow us to infer absurdly that swan cannot get into a yellow taxi. Or consider another nearby, quote unquote, nearby non-paradoxical story involving God telling Swan not that you have not gotten into a primary colored vehicle, but instead, I see that I didn't put my end quote, but instead that you have gotten into a primary colored vehicle, right? In this case, the only difference between the original and new story is in God's simply omitting the word not. In line with Proust's thinking, imagine I now say, hey, if the benign revelation story is possible, well, then surely the paradoxical one is possible too. Again, this strikes me as absurd. And what's more, recall the Bridges of Königsberg example, right? Suppose we take Königsberg bridges as they actually are and simply build one tiny bridge with like three bricks across a shallow and slim part of the river. Well, in that case, you actually could cross all the bridges of Königsberg without doubling back on yourself. By the way, it has seven bridges, and given its like topology or whatever, it forms a non-Eulerian circuit, and so you actually can't 
cross all seven bridges without doubling back on yourself in the process, essentially. If you added these just tiny, this tiny little bridge over here with like three bricks, you could cross all the bridges without doubling back on yourself. But if it's possible for you to cross the bridges without doubling back on yourself in this benign story, well, then we might reason you should be able to do that in the original story or example. The only difference between the situations is three bricks arranged in a specific way. And yet, of course, this reasoning is surely absurd, right? <laughs> no, it, it's it's not the case that if it's, if it's possible for you to traverse the bridges without doubling back on yourself, because you have these three little arranged bricks, it doesn't follow from that then it would also be possible for you to cross all the bridges without doubling back on yourselves without that little arrangement of bricks, because then you would actually have the non-Eulerian circuit in the bridges of Königsberg, and you wouldn't be able to cross all of them. So again, this reasoning is surely absurd, and yet it's relevantly similar to Proust's reasoning. Anyway, that's going to have to do it. If you guys like this video, be sure to, well, like it. Click that little like button, subscribe, turn on that little bell for notifications, and finally, consider supporting me on Patreon. I'm a lowly college student, and so all of your help is really helping me get an education and in turn using that education to help educate you guys, right? I don't make any money on this platform. And so it really helps. It helps pay my student debt. And it also encourages me to keep serving you guys with uh, love and rigor and yeah, philosophical charity and so on. Anyway, what better way to end is there than I'm Joe Schmidt. This is The Majesty of Reason and peace out.